Here it is, it's the week before Christmas, and we've got ourselves a very special episode. No, 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 not the Festivus episode. That always drops on Festivus, which is December 23rd, whether Joe likes it or not. No, um, Joe and I have been doing this series of comics we like from the 60s, and now we're at the 70s. We invited artist Angel Medina, who we've met and known for quite a long time through the local Minnesota Comic Book Convention, and we started talking comics, and we went for three hours. Now, in the past, we would have split this up into two episodes or edited it down to a regular episode size, but come on! It's three old friends talking about comics from the 70s, their favorite era of comics? You're getting the whole thing. Um, no ads this week, no plugs, no nothing, just three guys talking comics. Sit back, put on your headphones, and imagine you're sitting at a table in a hotel bar with Joe, Angel Medina, and me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rat Bastard. Well, hello, and welcome once again to Crazy Comics and Stories. It's me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rat Bastard. And at the other end of the series of tubes and wires that we call the internets is Joe, Crazy Writer. How you doing today, Joe? Who, you, who are you? And why, why are you in my headphones? Well, I, I, you should know me by now. However, do, do you have pants on? No. Did you clean the bathroom? Yes. Did you put away all the porn? Yes. We have a special guest on the phone, Joe. Ooh! Special guest, could you please sign in and announce yourself? Hello, this is Mr. Angel Medina. All from the Christmas song, Angel, we have heard on high, sweetly signing all our spawns. I can tell you're not wearing any pants, by the way. You're the I know. I, know. I, I, if I had any time, if I had some, I'd be, I'd be singing low. <sighs> it's comic artist, legend, and a damn handsome man, Angel Medina. How are things in Chicago? It's pretty good, considering that I hear all these places like Atlanta and Texas are getting snow. And I'm looking outside my window right now, and all we have so far is a light dusting. It's wonderful, isn't it, watching the Southerners freak out? Oh, yeah, I know. Because my, I was just talking to my brother about that because we were saying, like, they don't have any equipment to handle, not even one inch of snow. We, you know, we don't pull our equipment out until we've got at least a foot. So. I had somebody call from California at my full-time job, and she was asking what the temperature was here. And I said, oh, you know, it's, uh, what, like uh, 30. And she freaked out, and I said, pfft. Come on, we don't even button our coats up till it gets below zero. Oh yeah, and that's and you know that's not even sitting around because uh, uh, a couple of days ago I was at the store and I saw a couple of ladies that was at the Target and they didn't even have coats on and we were like in the low thirties. That <laughs> people don't start putting stuff on putting stuff on until we start hitting like the teens or something like that. Well, we didn't call to ask you about the weather. We did. Oh well. Well, the thing is, is I'm such an interesting guy on any subject that you can ask me anything and I'll get you going. But we are going to be talking about our favorite comics from the 70s. And who better than the man I have spent countless hours talking about uh, Marvel 2 and 1 <laughs> oh, you mean at conventions comics. with? Yeah! Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, all right. I, have to I know, he takes, takes the fun he out of everything. Them. We've made many, many references on Facebook about the comic books like Giant Size Man Thing and Marvel 2 and 1 and whether they should, they, they could be uh, titles for things outside of comics. I just know that I was happy every time Black Widow showed up on Marvel 2 and 1. Thank yeah. you. Well, Thank you know, you. You've been I, did a, I did a show, a uh, convention in Mexico about a month ago, and of all people, my ex editor from Marvel, uh, uh, Renee Witterstead. We were around sitting around at dinner time, a bunch of other artists, and 
she was she wanted to play a game where we try to mention as many characters as we possibly can that could also pass off as uh, um, porn stars, you know. And I thought of all people. <laughs> And, of course, my contribution was Iron Fist. So. <coughs> what about the Elongated Man? See, that's a, yeah, those are the names that they all kept coming up with. Okay. Oh, come on, come on. Giant-sized man thing. It practically yeah. writes itself. Oh, yeah, well, that was the very first one that we, that we thought of. Uh, that, I think that's actually what sparked off the conversation. <laughs> but the weird thing is that these were, like, editors that I used to be very conservative people that I thought of, you know, like Danny Fingeroff and Renee Wittestetter and... I was just saying, here I am, or Mike Zach was there, and to sit around with these guys who are usually very conservative, and suddenly they're playing this, they came up with this game, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> who, came, who used the red bee? <laughs> See, that's a forgotten character. They didn't even, they wouldn't even know who that was. <laughs> hey, if they showed up at All-Star Squadron, I know who they are. Yeah. <laughs> But we're talking 70s comics. Now, Angel, you started reading comics in the 70s, and we've talked in the past about uh, your love of that era. Yeah. So, um, Joe, you started later than the both of us, if I remember right. You started in, what, 78? Hang on a second. I can find the exact... Yes, February 1978. Now, is that because you were uh, uh, young, are you younger than us, or is it that you just came into comics later than us? No, that was actually the first issue of Spider-Man that I got that got me collecting, as opposed to just what I had done beforehand was just kind of read comics. I always call that my BC, before comics. You know, it's like my cousin had to run a Conan comics I read, another cousin had Fantastic Four, a kid down the block had a bunch of Disney stuff. And then later on, I found out the stories I really liked were done by uh, Carl Barks. But what had happened is that year for Christmas, you know, I had a lot of cousins. And so to, to keep Christmas cheap, we do what we call in the Midwest, I guess, Chris Crinkle, which is something else somewhere else. But essentially, everybody pulls a name out of a hat and you get that person a gift instead of getting all 15 cousins a gift. And what my... One cousin, and I'll call him out by name, Jerry Palmo, he gave me four Fantastic Four comics and a Spider-Man. And the Spider-Man happened to be 178, which I believe was part three of uh, Bart Hamilton being the third grade goblin. And I had a cover on it where Mary Jane is dabbing the ever sick, Aunt May's forehead, and in the background, she's thinking, where are you, Peter? You don't have much time. And you look out the hospital window, and there, conveniently flying by, is Spider-Man fighting the Green Goblin. Now, what got me going is I took the Fantastic Four comics to, at the time, it was called Twin City Comics, Craig Ketter's first comic shop. He owns, of course, Dreamhaven now. And he gave me 20 cents a piece for these comics, and then I could turn around and buy some more Spider-Man comics. And I often tell him, you really just should have said, kid, get the F out of my store. I'm going to save you from a lifelong of a... But he didn't, and that's what started me going down the road. So you're talking... Was think, that was like, what, was 60 think. cents? That's like almost two more comics, because comics were like 35 cents at that time. Yeah, I know. Actually, when you first said that, I thought, you know, being that the 70s and kind of the way comic book geeks were at that time and the way prices were... And the way we would buy comics, you know, with our spare change or whatever, to make that deal to you, that's, a, you know, a comic book guy. That's, like you said, it's, that's a, you're never going to get rid of the guy after that. No. No, I actually followed Greg through almost all of his stores. Uh, and something when, what did he just celebrate? His 40th anniversary in, in wow. retailing a couple of years ago? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I went through all the incarnations in his store. And uh, when he finally did close up the first time, you know, there was a store a couple miles away called uh, St. Paul Comics. But people didn't like to go there because he charged a whole dime for a, a board and bag. <laughs> but what's up with that? Rather than go into detail on, on the rest of Joe's Christmas stuff, I thought we'd talk about our favorite comics of the 70s. Now, Angel and I have spent many hours after conventions talking about 70s comics. You're and one of the few people I can do that with, that's why. 
<laughs> and there seems to be this... I forget who said it, but the golden age is 12. Whatever you loved when you were 12 years old is what you're going to love forever. And I've noticed when I go back, I can see the flaws in those comics much better than when I originally read them. And uh, it's easy to see the flaws because the paper's so thin. (laughs) But I thought we'd talk about the stuff that we loved, and uh, I'm going to start with uh, one that everybody knows that I have deep, deep abiding love for, and that is uh, Jack Kirby's Fourth World. Well, before you go on, can I ask you something? Because you sent me a list before this whole thing of your top ten, so I thought, you know what, I'm going to make a top ten list, too, of mine. Um, Are are you going to start from, like, number one? I was wondering, are we going to do the Cisco and Ebert thing where we start from number ten and work our way down to number one? I don't have them in order of preference. I just have a list. If okay. You, if you did it in preference, you could start with number 10, but we're just going to go round robin. I figured that was the way it was going to go, but just to be on the safe side, I went ahead and made my list, and I did it the Cisco and Ebert way, where I made it 10 from uh, 10 from the bottom. So then uh, I don't want to take away from yours right now. So then when you put this fourth world, um, do you, would you know if that's your top favorite or that's just on the list? It's just on, on the list. Out of these ten, I don't know if I could pick a favorite because it would depend on the day. It would depend on the mood. It would depend yeah, on yeah. what I had just read. Like yeah. over the weekend, I read one of the books on the list that I'll talk about. That well, right now that one's my favorite. Yeah, yeah, I understand. And, and then when I get the Kirby Fourth World Omnibus in the mail, that'll be my favorite. So, uh, Kirby's Fourth World, I did not read it when it came out because I wasn't reading comics yet. I discovered it back when... Um, so I didn't read uh, uh, Kirby's Fourth World because I didn't read uh, any Kirby stuff uh, at all when I was a kid. Because, you know, being a kid that, you know, you know, I was in elementary school at that time, uh, we didn't like elementary schoolers. We didn't like Kirby stuff because it looked too weird for us, you know. So I, I don't think, when I look at my list, I don't think I've got any of Kirby's stuff from the 70s, not because I don't, I don't love the stuff, which I do, but it's just that I was, I, I never, I didn't like it as much as a, uh, when I was a kid. So I don't think I put any of that stuff on my list. Like, you should, you told me right now the fourth. Well, I look at that stuff and I marvel at it, but uh, I don't got it on my list just because it, it was just way too funky for me when I was a kid. Well, when I was digging into Kirby, when he left comics altogether, I started reading you know, the um, Overstreet Price Guide, and it talked about this run he did over at DC. And I was like, "Oh wow, I got to find those!" And going to the uh, the gentleman who had a comic shop in his garage in Canton, Illinois, he was charging three, four bucks each for them, which was way too rich for my blood when oh, comics yeah. were fifty cents. But then DC started reprinting them, and I just okay, I'm hooked. I have to have them all. So in college, I hunted them all down, and I, I bought the uh, the trade paperbacks they did that were oh, yeah. black and white, yeah. and then the uh, color omnibuses they did, and now I've bought the great big omnibus, because I'm addicted to omnibuses. Well, it's amazing how crazy those ideas look to us now and how genius they look. But like as I said, I remember when I was a kid, if you would introduce me to Fourth World, I would have been by, distracted by the fact that they had characters on there with names like Granny Goodness, and I would have been as a kid, that's stupid. You know, now that we're grown up, we look at it and we go, wow, that's really cool. But, you know, as a kid, I wanted serious comic book stuff, not characters running around with names like Granny Goodness or... Uh, or Funky or Flashman. Or Funky Flashman, yeah. Well, Angel, what was uh, number 10 on your list? Uh, number 10 on my list, actually on my list, I put down a... That when you were talking about you can't choose just the one, but by the time I got to number ten on what I just wanted to choose as my number ten spot, it was hard for me to decide because I was going through a bunch of them. So I just thought, you know what, this number ten could probably at any point change. So I just thought, okay, what do I feel like right now? And I think I was at that point where you're talking about what your favorite is for today. I had just finished reading rereading uh, Mike Grell's Warlord. And I oh, just thought, you know yeah. what, I'm going to put that on my number 10 list because that's a name you don't see too much on anybody's list. Or when we get into comic book conversations, you don't hear too many people talk about that. And I just thought, you know what, I almost came to putting down uh, 
uh, Conan the Barbarian as number 10. But I thought, you know what, I'm going to put, uh, if we're going to go Barbarian World, I'm going to put Warlord instead because that's something you don't see talked about that much. And I think that was the height of Mike Grell's career in terms of both writing and artistry. Uh, half that half that series came out in the 70s. The other half, his other, the other half of his run came out in the 80s. So I'm going to mention that when we got, he got to his anniversary issue, number 50. Corey, if you want to see an insanely beautiful piece of artwork, look at the cover for issue 50 of uh, Warlord, and that is probably my grill, like, masterpiece. You look at that piece of artwork, and you look at and I, you're, I swear you're going to think to yourself, why aren't more people talking about the series when you look at just that cover itself? And the other thing is that it lasted a long time. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the reasons was because it was also by it was by month. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it was it was a slow. I mean, he was writing, uh, penciling, and I think inking it at the same time. So he only had it at a at a bi monthly rate. So it did last a long time. But you're only getting six issues a year, and I think he stopped around like issue seventy or something like that. Maybe he might have been earlier than that. And then, but it continued. Uh, a while after that, yeah, but he had a really long run in there. Oh, that is a beautiful cover. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, what, that was, uh, I think, if I remember right, that was Dan Jurgen's first work in comics. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think after Grell left, I think he started yep. thinking and then maybe he jumped, yeah, but I remember that. Well, yeah. Grell was still writing it when Jurgen's yeah. took over on the art, so... Yeah. Well, you know, one of the reasons that I also put it on my list is because since I just finished rereading it, and I haven't read it in, like, forever, in such a long time, and as I read it, reread it again, the thing that I liked about it is, one, his uh, his continuity is really good on it, the way he tries to uh, keep the characters going and, uh, you know, consistent flow to the characters and the continuity and everything. But then also, um, you, uh, you only see the purpose of why he decided to do this whole character of a... You know, it wasn't just, he it, it was sort of like a John Carter Warlord of Mars, where instead of traveling to Mars, he traveled underneath the Earth and found this savage world. But the whole story, the whole idea of the uh, Warlord seemed to be this guy who really just wants to find his inner hairy man, Travis Morgan, and he finds it when he goes down into this barbarian world, and he just decides, okay, now I'm going to do all the stuff I wanted to do as where, you know, he's a real hero looking for adventure and he's just, you know, pulling out the sword and the gun, whatever he really wants. And I like that idea and I just thought this is something I didn't realize when I used it when first read that series years ago when it first came out and now we're reading it, I look at it and I go, you know, this is uh this is better than what most people probably remember being. Joe, what's on your list? Well, we'll go back to uh, what I was talking about beginning of The Amazing Spider-Man, the first comic that I actually got into, and that whole run to finish the 70s. And you'll find that a lot with the books I did, because I started late 70s. I had to go back and figure out, okay, did it actually come out in the 70s, or was it something that I picked up later? Because you figure as 78 as the starting point, And I was able to go back to about 129 in terms of collecting Spider-Man just by buying back issues and stuff. Uh, And then my old partner, Pat Gruber, he let me read his Spider-Man collection, which brought me, like, uh, Ramita up to uh, the death of Gwen Stacy. So somehow I knew about all these characters. So you're talking from 178, and then it goes up to about 200, which actually has a cover date of 1980. And just a a crazy run because, you know, first of all, I knew who the Green Goblin was. I knew who the dad was. So for me, it was a mystery. Who was this third Green Goblin? And, of course, as you go back and you reread it, because I was reading the back issues backwards, yeah, it was pretty obvious it was Bart Hamilton. Uh, You go forward, uh, 181 was like kind of a whole recap issue so it kind of covered everything that happened to date nowadays it'd be almost impossible because there's what about five thousand titles on everything of course rocket racer oh you can't get enough of that guy and big wheel and the big wheel you you can't think of rocket racer without thinking of big wheel no you gotta have them both i'm telling you yeah and of course he graduated college which was like whoa this was big i mean this was like a change of the status quo 
and I had to go back and reread uh, through those uh, pocketbooks all of the times he was in high school. I mean, to have a, ca- a character actually move on in life, he graduated college. And then, of course, they, the police in the next issue made it so that he wasn't uh, wanted by the police. And they actually referred to one of the novels that were being published at the time, uh, which I think is the only time they've done it. I forget the name of the novel. But they actually Murder were- in Manhattan or Mayhem in Manhattan, and it was written by Marv Wolfman. And which, you know, makes sense because he was writing the issue when 186. Uh, you go forward and they had that, the wonderful issue where uh, Spider-Man was chained to uh, J. Jonah Jameson because of uh, Spencer Smythe, you know, the spider slayer. And then, of course, uh, you have that when they finally break free, Jonah kind of breaks down uh, to himself as to why he does what he does. But it kept going. I mean, first appearance of Black Cat, which, you know, by the time the next issue came, she was gone. So, <laughs> and we thought she died. But then the, the issue that really nailed it for me was the 195, because not only did Black Cat seemingly die, but Parker blew off Betty Brant in such a cruel way that his friends just kind of like, oh, my God, who is this guy we've been dealing with? And they walk away. The end of the issue, he gets a telegram. You're aunt had died i mean i couldn't concentrate for an entire freaking month waiting for that next issue i mean i was just in nerves and of course uh, by the time you get to uh the, the the big fight with kingpin where it wasn't even wasn't even words it was just them slugging it out each other and this was a major thing to get kingpin off the board and he didn't come back until frank miller brought him back in daredevil uh and then of course you get into the actual 200 that uh, brings back the burglar that shot Uncle Ben. I mean, this was some pretty heady stuff. And, you know, Corey and I have talked about as you get, as you get on, uh, there was a run of mediocrity where, was it, Shooter decided, no, every issue Spider-Man has to be done in one, and he fights a new villain. But these were just incredible. I mean, you couldn't have asked for a better run of Spider-Man to start with. And back then, there were, there were ways to... Go back and figure out. You can find old back issues. I think the most expensive back issue I had, uh, and you know, we're talking uh, uh, not not one not one twenty nine because when I got it, it was still before everybody was like, "Oh my God, Punisher! We gotta jack that price up." <laughs> but uh, it was the one where uh, I'm looking at it here. I think one sixty one one sixty. No, I'm sorry. One sixty was a Tinker. Another one. You know, he hadn't appeared since early Spider-Man, but 161, 162 that had X-Men in it. So at the time, the X-Men craze was going nuts, and those books were already super hyper-inflated, and to try to find them were, were, I mean, it was just a godsend. So it's just a fun run, you know, back when continuity mattered, and there was only a single book. Spider-Man was a street-level villain. He wasn't world-renowned, you know. And I have not missed an issue of Spider-Man since. I've always stuck with Amazing Spider-Man. I may not pick up all of the crossovers and all the other things, and but uh, definitely, even to this day, I, I still pick up Amazing Spider-Man. Don't have them all. Again, the 129 when that sucker broke 100 bucks, I sold it. But <laughs> that's the thing with my comics. I, you know, between having two stores and doing cons, I just got to the point. If it went up in price, sell it because I figure if I want another one, I can get it. Hey, well, let me ask you real quick. Uh, um, you say you still uh, pick up Spider-Man to this day, right? Oh, yeah. Amazing spider Yeah. So um, I, someone who hasn't really kept up with comics, do they still got the same numbering, or is it, or has the numbering changed now? Marvel is doing what they call a legacy, where they're returning all the books back to the what the numbering would have been had they not gone through that period where every 12 months we're going to have a re- yeah. number one and Secret Wars will reset with a number one and so on and so on. So, yeah, the, the numbers are going to be, uh, I don't even know, what is Amazing Spider-Man, 697 or something? Yeah, they're about to hit 700. But, yeah, they didn't do them sequentially. So, they it, it I, Maggie Thompson, you know, this buyer's guy, too, he said it was such a headache trying to categorize these things because, okay, Amazing Spider-Man went into Amazing Spider-Man 1, and then it went into another one, and then, uh, <laughs> But 
fact, that's that's one of Marvel's idea to bring back long term fans who have dropped the book is to go back to legacy numbering. Yeah, yeah I know. That's why. Yeah, yeah. I, I I know about the legacy number, but I didn't know if they still if they had done if Spider Man ever did get off track or if that always stayed on it. Because I was going to say, if you stay with Amazing Spider Man, then it, well, you just answered my question. I wanted to know what number there. It's funny you say that it, there's 600 some because for some reason to me it seems like it would be even be even farther along than that. But maybe well, if you count the variant covers. Especially that 666. I mean, that was the one that all the different stores had variant covers. I mean, I'm yeah. just looking here. There's uh, 107 different comic stores that participated in that. Wow. So if you, if you want to do, uh, you know, really go crazy. And the angel wasn't asked to do any of them. <laughs> well, I so don't you know. need to start shaking hands with Marvel editors. Yeah, I know. Right, my problem is uh, all, my, all the guys I knew at Marvel were going. Uh, well, the next one on my list is one that Angel might know a little about. I don't know. It's Warlock by Jim Starlin. That's on my list, too. Mine as well. And, and when I was, uh, what, 13, 14 years old, um, my babysitter's uh, boyfriend gave me his entire run of all the strange tales and then the first three issues of Warlock. And I'm sorry, when you're 13 years old and you read Jim Starlin's Warlock, it's going to blow your mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was like, how can they do this in a comic? Yeah. What the, and it's connected to the Marvel Universe. And it's, oh, it, ah. And the good thing is, when I go back and read it, it's still very cool. It's still very yeah. in, innovative. Starlin just plays with the format of a mainstream comic and stretches and pulls it and throws all sorts of things. And now that I'm older, I understand more of what he was putting in there, like Night of a Thousand Clowns, where he was yeah. making fun of his time at Marvel itself. Um, and just think, you know, the, the whole Marvel movie thing has been pulling from what he did for those books. The odd thing is, Marvel hasn't reprinted it as a you know collected book that often. Back in the early '80s, they reprinted it when they were doing the Marvel um, the Baxter reprints, mm -hmm. and they. But I looked, and there's only been one trade paperback of it. Now, here's the thing: the uh, Warlock Essentials. That one went out of print almost immediately. Um, I was actually looking through because Marvel's dumping a bunch of stuff on the market again. Oh, you you want a copy of that Warlock Essentials? That's one hundred and twenty five dollars. And to me, it's like, why would you want that? Because as you said, they reprinted it in the the uh, complete Warlock, which has the entire. I mean, they don't have the early stuff that like Roy Thomas, Mike Friedrich did uh, the pre Jim Starlin stuff, and probably with good reason, but. Even now, my, my daughters, and, you know, Dana's 23, Holly's 18, they're reading it. Can you imagine? I mean, that long ago, these things came out, way back, 73, 75, and kids are still reading it. Well, they're kids to me, but, you know. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned the Baxter series, because there's always, we, one of the, the interesting things that I always wish I could figure out is, where did I become aware of the Warlock series of Starlin. And for me, you go back to Marvel 2-in-1, the very end of the first saga. And again, Spider-Man was in it, which is why I picked it up. And here you got a big fight, part two, Thanos versus the Avengers, and uh, Chaos and Order bring in Spider-Man to uh, help, I don't know, whatever they're doing. Who, who knows what... what super deities are up to anyways but that was my first exposure to warlock his death and it, again it was a number of years before i found marvel annual number seven was it and yeah, from the there annual seven yeah and from there the baxter series came in and filled it filled in the hole and then later on i was able to uh you know pick up the original ones and uh Matter of fact, if, you, if you're looking for one, I th when it started, what, in Strange Tales? Yep. Yeah, that, that one with that first appearance of Gamora, that, you find that baby in mint shape. That's, that's going to be one of those big ones because uh, 
but comics in the 70s, again, they weren't as hardcore collected as they were in the 80s, so finding them in good shape is, is tough. But this is yeah. a case, you know, just the way Marvel reprinted things and they, they, uh, you know, they did the crossover between Avengers and that. So I saw the end of Warlock before I saw the beginning. And then, of course, you flash forward to Infinity Gauntlet when he showed up again. I was like, <laughs> this is going to be fun. Now, did you guys pick this one up off the newsstand? I picked it up the newsstand. I was, um, I got into Warlock. Uh, uh, Warlock's on my list. So I'll talk about it real quick right now. It's just that uh, I got, uh, I picked it up off the newsstand, but I picked it up because they were, uh, it was a backup story when they were reprinting um, fantasy masterpieces with the Silver Surfer. And then they yeah. had, and then they would have uh, the Warlock in, as a backup. And that's how I got introduced to it. I knew of the character. But then I didn't start reading it until that series came along, and that came at a perfect time because I was just in, I was in sixth grade, and sixth grade is that time when you uh, left elementary school, and now you're into uh, middle school or junior high school, as we called it back then. And that's when your mind starts shifting from uh, thinking about what's in front of you, and you start thinking more along to on um, more intangible. I thoughts and ideas, which is exactly what Warlock was doing. Warlock was the first comic that came into my life where I realized, oh, it, comics don't have to be just about, you know, a hero fighting a bad guy. You can also introduce intangible concepts into the series, which was what Jim Starlin was doing with Warlock. And as uh, Corey said earlier, because of that, it really blew my mind because I was at that point in my life where that was coming into, those ideas were coming into my head to begin with. And I remember when I first read my first issue of Warlock, which was in the back of uh, Fantasy Masterpieces, it literally blew my mind. And I just thought, holy crap. I think, uh, uh, in my mind, I felt like comics were being moved forward, and me, I was being moved forward, too, as a comic book reader. And so that's why that was on my list, and that's why it stuck with me for so long, because I, I would say that if there is such a thing as adult themes in comic books or adult-oriented comic, that would have been my first experience was with Warlock. Well, what's next on your list, Angel? Well, next on my list is, I know this is probably higher on most people's list, is Howard the Duck by Gerber and... And I think we, me and you have had an extensive discussions of why this is such a, um, yep. uh, why this is the classic comic that it is. So I got that number nine. I would have had it higher on my list, but the problem, the reason I don't is because since I was such a kid, when I was a kid, I, was, I got into comics for one reason, and that's because I wanted to read about superheroes. And Howard the Duck, when I first saw it, I thought, oh, this is, you know, a dumb idea of the duck. But then I read the first story of Howard the Duck I ever read was the Hell Cow uh, story, which was in... Uh, I love I think that it, story so Yeah, and Giant Fight Mansion, right? That's the Hell Cow. I, I read that. And two, utter. <laughs> and two things surprised me about that. It wasn't just the fact that, you know, Howard the Duck was fighting, you know, a vampire cow, because you thought, okay, this is something you would read in, a, you know, the kitty book. But the fact is, is that it was far from being a kitty storyline. Well, I remember when I first read that story, I thought to myself, holy crap, this is a story for grown-ups. And I mean, mean that literally. If a little kid read that, he would not understand what the heck was going on here. And the way that they wrote it, I thought to myself, wow, this is, it was like reading the Warlock story, except this time it's a duck fighting, you know, a vampire cow. And that's the first thing that blew my mind about it, but what also blew my mind is the beautiful artwork that came along with it. I think it was Frank Bruno who drew that yep. issue. And I remember looking at this and thinking, holy crap, the artwork in this thing is amazing. And between the writing and the artwork, that's what really got me going on um, on Howard the Duck. So uh, that that's why. And so from there on in, I just started uh, looking up the issues. And uh, every issue I read just blew my mind as a kid. The funny thing is, is that I liked it, but I didn't love it. I didn't start loving it until I uh, I got much older. And when I was a kid, I would buy it because there was that weird quirkiness to the whole thing about it. And that's what kept me coming back. It was more to see 
what the heck are they going to do now more than, you know, me running to the stand to see what was going on with each issue. And stuff. So I enjoyed, I enjoyed it a lot more. As a matter of fact, I love uh, the prose in that book. The way he writes that book is really eloquently written. I think that anyone, that's what, like, one book, if I ever had to uh, recommend, recommend a comic book to uh, a fellow grown-up now, I would say, why don't you start reading, you know, Howard the Duck, just, you know, just to see what their reaction is on something so quirky and yet so well written as it was. And the satire he got away with was just so dark. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. You know, when Howard ran for president, oh, you're number one in the polls. Really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. More people are trying to kill you than are trying to kill <laughs> Ford or yeah. Carter. Yeah. And it was, you know, based on the fact that there'd been two assassination attempts on Gerald Ford. Yeah. Just you wouldn't even do that sort of humor now. Yeah, but I think it was because it was comics. People didn't really dig into it too deep. Yeah, um, and I would say that issue sixteen, which was the one where Gerber wrote a whole bunch of essays, yeah, yeah, as he was moving yeah. out to Vegas, is still one of the most brilliant comics ever published. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That's my favorite of the entire run. And yeah. First off, the fact that he was able to get away with it. And second, the fact that, you know, as a kid, I started reading it because Stan Lee was mentioning it every month in the bullpen bulletins. Yeah. So he must have really liked it, or he wouldn't have been pushing it that hard. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I always thought there was a weirdness to, to the whole Howard the Duck phenomenon and the fact that when you talk about it, you wonder how he got away with that. I always just thought, well, there was so much under people's radar because of the book called Howard the Duck. Yet at the same time, you're right, I do remember how much Stanley pushed that book, which is why I started looking for it when I was a kid. Because you know, I was one of those kids that I absorbed every word in a comic book. So I read every item page or whatever, bulletin page or whatever. And so when I kept seeing him pushing that book, I thought, oh, I'll get it just because... You know, I get it from him, but it's it, that is a Howard the Duck is just this little weird uh, phenomenon in comic book history when you really look at it. Just the whole idea of it, not just the book itself, but when it was being published and what they were doing with it and how they were pushing it. It's just this weird little thing that you, it's hard to describe to anyone. You know what this Howard the Duck is to begin with, and what's really weird is that you know someone who drew the Kiss book. Uh, for many years, and people are asking me about it, and I always talk about how Kiss's first uh, uh, appearance was in Howard the Duck. When I tell that to non-comic book fans, like the Kiss fans, they'll give me this weird look like, Kiss first appearance, what? And I'm trying to explain to them Howard the Duck, and they don't, you know, that makes it even weirder, you know. That's interesting, because the uh, back issue 101 that just came out, from Tomorrow Press is like a rock and roll comic issue, and they have a huge article about all the Kiss comics that came out, uh, including the Howard the Duck. And what yeah. I guess I didn't realize is that Kiss owns the copyrights to all that, including the Super Special, where they have the Marvel comic characters uh, are like searching all over for the Kiss people. Because you often wonder why the Marvel just didn't republish it, but not theirs to republish. It's Kiss. Yeah, yeah. Well, Joe, what's next on your list? It's actually one that's on your list. The uh, Doctor Strange series that uh, started out with uh, Sting Steve Englehart and Frank Brunner. Now, when I jumped on board, again, it was, I think, at issue number 29, which was kind of a nondescript issue where uh, Nighthawk and Doctor Strange team up. And I just kept reading forward from there. Now, what I would do is these were probably the newsstand issues. Uh, and I would just keep going forward from there and read along as, as the issues went. Uh, I How I found out about Doctor Strange is, will be in, a, in an issue coming up or a series coming up that I'll talk about later, but it also, you know, it did things like they did the crossover that uh, into man thing. So then I started reading the man thing issues and trying to pick up back issues. Now, how I got the number one, because, you know, we're already way up in 29. If you remember back then, Mile High Comics had the huge two-page spread, usually in the middle, advertising comics and stuff. Yeah, well, I, I got on 
their list to get their catalogs. And so back then, the naive Joe was, you know what, I'm going to get one of every Marvel published. But what I would do is I would pick a title, start with number one, and that month, order issue one. So this month, I probably ordered like Ms. Marvel number one, Doctor Strange number one, and then maybe, uh, you know, it'd probably be about 20 bucks worth of comics. Next month, number two, month after that, number three. And then, of course, the, the story was so good, even with the, the fill-in issue at number three, I went down to a local comic store and where I'd been buying fine copies from Mile High. He had two copies of four and five that were only good. So I, I picked those up just because I wanted to. And then, of course, it had a crossover into Avengers annuals, some weird thing I still don't get these days. And But that's what got me going on the early Doctor Strange. And then, of course, the pocketbooks came out that had the, the Ditko run. And I, I was vaguely aware there was a time when he had a, a mask on. And it was just all these groovy things that you could go back and try to find as a collector. And back then it was easier and cheaper to, to pick up back issues because if you didn't pick them up at the comic store, you pick them up when cons came around and things like that. So it was just, it was just a crazy, wonderful world to read. Uh, and then, of course, Doctor Strange is one of those, that, again, that I, I've just stuck with the whole time. Uh, I've, I've actually tried to pick up almost all of his early stuff. I, I, the Strange Tales, and when he had his own name series, the first series, I've actually, because it's been republished in various formats, I have it that way. But from Brunner on, I do have this run, including, uh, again, this is another title that is like every so often it, it goes and then it putters out and then Doctor Strange comes back and it goes and it putters out and the current incarnation is going pretty good we'll see how long it lasts and one artist that we've all mentioned oddly enough is Frank Brunner yeah who um, he was kind of the first artist I remember who just vanished yeah and he didn't even go over to DC he just disappeared and I remember in the early days of, um, what was it, First Comics, he worked on Warp for a while, right? I remember that, yeah, yeah. And then he vanished again. And, you know, I know that he's, a, a lot of why he left was the work for hire contract. But I hope that he actually continued his art somewhere and got paid really well for it, because you know, that was his early stuff, and it was mind-blowing. I can't even imagine how good it would be after, you know, another five, six years of drawing. Well, I'll be honest with you. I've seen, his, uh, I've seen recent art from him because uh, there's a, I do uh, commissions, uh, private commissions for certain people, and uh, uh, I, got my, I got what I call regulars, people that I who regularly get work for me and uh, who get private uh, commissions for me. And uh, there's one guy that I got. His name's Mike Blanchard. He's probably the biggest Omega the Unknown fan out there. And uh, he actually has, uh, I've been to his house. He lives uh, uh, like in Idaho. And uh, he he actually uh, commissions uh, Frank Brunner to do some artwork. And he showed me some recent art well, pieces that he had grown a dude from a couple like Mansings and Howard the Duck, as a matter of fact. And it, it's just absolutely gorgeous. He does these big double page spread pieces for uh, the guy. You know, the art that I've seen is just absolutely stunning. But I don't know uh, what he's doing for a living, though. It's depressing when that happens. You know, yeah. I'm, I hope that he's happy. Yeah, yeah. And I understand. I understand the work for hire thing can really, you know, grate on your nerves. Yeah. But uh, I want to be greedy and get more of his stuff. Yeah, I know. That's um, a, there's a lot of artists who do that, and you always wonder. But I think some of them, it's just. The one thing I learned of getting into this business, you really got to love comics to stick with it. Oh, you yeah. know, I can see why a lot of people get out of it. You know, after a while, you're just, you know, you want a little bit more stability or you want more pay or whatever and stuff like that. So I can understand why some of these artists go, but it always seems like the ones that you want to stay the most are the ones who leave. And then you got people like Carmine Infantino and, you know, <laughs> the, with Frank Robbins sticking around until they're in their old, you know, whatever. Hey, but we, we still have Sal Buscema doing stuff. Oh, yeah. So some of the good people still stay. Yeah, some of them you want them to stay, but, you know. Yeah. 
Well, the next book on my list, since you guys grabbed a couple of mine, is actually the Black Panther run by Don McGregor, Billy Graham, and, um, oh, now I can't, who else was the other artist on that? Uh, you, you can't ask me because I, I didn't read that. Uh, oh, it was Rich thing? Buckler. It was yeah. Rich Buckler. Yeah. Now, I know Keith Pillar did the last couple of stories on this, but I'm a big fan of Keith Pillar. But that, was that right after all of that? Yes. Okay. He's He worked on the ones that were in uh, Marvel Presents, where they wrapped it up and somebody else did the wrap-up. Well, that's funny because they didn't even wrap it up because I got the last issue of it. it just, the story just ended. And they even put it oh. up. You know, they, they Captain, uh, Black Panther was finding a character called... Uh, Wind Eagle, and the way it yep. ended is they were facing each other, and then that was the last issue, and Marvel just said, well, we'd like to finish this, but sales are low, and I don't think they ever did wrap that story up. Yes, they did, in uh, Marvel Presents. Oh, did they? No, Marvel Premiere. So if you pick up the uh, the uh, second Black Panther masterwork, it's got those in it. Oh, okay. It's got all, all right. the Kirby stories and then that. And uh, to this day, Don McGregor's never read that conclusion because he didn't write it. Um, this was another one that was given to me by my babysitter's boyfriend, and it was another one where, you know, I'm just getting into comics, and they drop that on you, and this is literary stuff. You know, McGregor is building a world and doing, he's basically taking the idea of the Black Panther is the king of the most advanced technological nation in the world, and it begins with uh, one of the a character named Killmonger, attempting a coup d'etat. And, of course, because it was comics, it had to have his minions were all, you know, supervillain types. But it gets into philosophy. It gets into um, race relations. It gets into all those things. And then his second story is about the Black Panther versus the Ku Klux Klan. Not the Sons of the Serpent. No, the actual Ku Klux Klan. And... The other thing that I, as a kid, you know, Spider-Man would get shot, and then an issue later is, oh, my spider powers healed my shoulder, everything's fine. Black Panther got the shit beat out of him, and he was hurt. He would bleed. He would not be in good shape the next issue, because somebody just beat the ever-loving crap out of him. And it showed the consequences of the violence. It's another one of those books that... Um, was aimed at adults. It didn't sell real well at the time, but if you ever get your hands on the first Black Panther um, masterwork, there is a heartbreaking essay in there by Dwayne McDuffie about how being a black kid, picking up that comic, it was, oh wow, it's a black superhero who doesn't use fake slang, who's not a sidekick. Yeah, yeah. He's a real hero. And it's, I think, um, you know, McGregor talks about it at the time, he got a lot of shit from Marvel, because they, well, the first run, it's like, why aren't there any white people here? The Fantastic Four should show up. It's like, no, it's in Africa. There aren't any, there aren't white people there. But, again, and it holds up so well. You know, the prose is a little purple, and it's a little overwritten, but it still holds up so well. That's something i got to read, because I've been mean, that's what that's always been on my two-read list, but I, I just never got around. Like, it's one of the things that just keeps slipping my mind. And I've heard, not just from you, but I've heard from a lot of people about uh, about McGregor's run on the Black Panther. And the other thing I really like about it is it's one of the few times where Rich Buckler's drawing his own style. I don't he's think not I know imitating Kirby. Stuff. He's not imitating Buscema. Yeah. Angel, what's next on your list? Uh, let's see here. On my list, I've got uh, um, Omega the Unknown, also by Gerber, and this time drawn by Mooney. That was a uh, that was you know it's funny now. I didn't think about it until I started we we started having this discussion. I think a lot of these are those books that. Uh, we're at that point where you're just starting to read, to uh, understand that comics are more about, like, uh, can be more than just a uh, hero fighting the bad guy. And that's what Omega the, the Unknown was for me, is when that came out, 
I bought that because I remember that was a brand new superhero who had a really cool costume. And thinking I was going to pick up another, you know, typical Marvel superhero book. And boy, did that turn out to be not the case. It seemed like this was Gerber's um, attempt at trying to draw, okay, well, I have to draw the superhero character, but I can't draw, I, I'm sorry, I have to write about the superhero character, but I can't write just about a superhero character. And so it was more about James Michael, the, the little kid, than it really was about Omega the Unknown. It seemed like the entire series focused more on that kid. And then for the sake of, well, you know, in order to sell books, you know, follow the Marvel formula, let's, you know, end the story with whatever's going on with Mar with uh, Omega fighting the Electro or whatever villain has to come up later on. You could tell his love was more writing for that kid than it was for uh, the actual Omega, the unknown guy. <laughs> I, I mean, did you, I mean, we've talked about that before, you know, and the fact is, is that this book didn't seem to be as quirky as his other stuff. But it was more like, okay, let's get into this kid and what life really is like for a kid who has to grow up, who's really different because, you know, this character is linked to Omega, and that's what made him so different. And boy, he just did not hold back on how how brutal, you know, it could be in, you know, high school or junior high school, even elementary school, how brutal life can be if you were that, you know, the, the, the outsider kid. Exactly. The only reason this didn't make my list is because there's no conclusion to the story. Right, right, right. But Gerber really, he captured that feeling of what it's like to be an outsider. But also, it was kind of as close as Marvel got to how just kind of grungy and nasty New York was in the 70s. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And even though the art cleaned it up a lot, because Jim Mooney, you know, Jim Mooney probably wouldn't be able to draw how, how just awful it was back then. But through the writing, you got the feel of, this is what it's like to be, you know, in poverty in New York City in the 70s. Yeah. And just how dangerous it felt. Yeah. When you go back and read it again, you know, there's this overwhelming sense of danger and unease yeah, that yeah. other comics didn't have at the time. You know, your superhero could be in trouble, but it wasn't like, oh yeah, your friend just got beat up by bullies so bad that he's in the hospital and will probably be crippled. Yeah, you know, and funny, that was the issue that really affected me the most, because it's exactly what you said as far as the greediness of the New York, because in any other comic, when they would have set up for that kid that he's about to get beat up, he would get saved either by a superhero or by some some guy, you know, with a good heart at the last minute. And the way the fact that this kid did not get saved and also the way that it was written, I always remember, like, right before, you know, it, it, it ends, you know, with the bullies, you know, around the, the kid as he's about to get beat up. And I always remember the way they wrote it, like, you know, he knew he was, I knew he knew he was going to beat up. And the best that he could do was try not to cry. And then the next yeah. issue you see, and there he is in the hospital. And, so, and I remember that really, that was like a big punch in my heart, thinking like, wow, this isn't a typical superhero book where the hero comes in and saves the day. This, I mean, he was just letting it all, like, you know. It, it, it's funny because Gerber was writing these books that he almost felt like, well, no one's paying attention to me, to, to them that much, but let me just write what I want to write. I mean, you know, when you really look at it, no one else would have, you know, what editor would have said to them, like, hey, you can't do this in Spider-Man? <laughs> I think that's one of the reasons why these lower-selling books and the, the books on the fringes, yeah, they were able to take more chances, so they were more interesting. Oh, yeah. Even when they failed, you would go, wow, that was a cool idea. Yeah, and and when you really look about it, these books on the fringes that were, even though they were on the fringes, you know, I joined a lot of uh, fa a comic book group, fan groups on Facebook and online, and these are the books that we talk about the most are the ones that were on the fringes because they didn't do well at that time, but years later, you know, they still got their fame. Joe, what's next on your list? Oh, you mean you're not going to talk about the, uh, the uh, uh, conclusion of Omega in the Defenders? No. No, that's not what we're talking about. 
Okay, that's probably <laughs> better, because that was my first... Like, Even the guy who wrote it, Stephen Grant, has said, no, it was terrible. Yeah, I had that no was kind of my uh, first no exposure idea. to a Mega Man, but... Yeah. Nobody likes that ending, especially the few fans of Omega the Unknown. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a, you know, and that's constantly, you know, I don't have a lot of other books on my list except Marvel because, you know, that's how I was. I was, I was not the Marvel zombie, but I, that's how I slowly got exposed in the comics. And the next comic I talk about is, is pretty much how I figured out most of the Marvel Universe, the Chris Marvel team-up. The first issue was number 72, who had Iron Man in it. And again, first time I read Iron Man. And then you go forward. Uh, let's see, what was 72 and Daredevil? And then, of course, we all remember what happened in 74. That was uh, Saturday Night Live. Oh, my God, not ready for primetime players with Silver yeah. Samurai in it? Holy yeah. cow. Uh, Power Man, yeah. but then this is probably how I got turned on to Doctor Strange because it's this is one and two of a four parter that had Doctor Strange in it, and what they did, which I thought was really cool at the time, so you had seventy six, seventy four, or seventy six, seventy seven, and then three issues later they did eighty, eighty one, and. We talked about an early podcast how those two were supposed to be part of an annual that came out that didn't. But for me, it was kind of like, oh, this is kind of like continuity. And that got me interested in Doctor Strange, which is probably why I jumped over where I did to pick up the Doctor Strange book. Uh, again, a great, crazy crossover where Mary Jane got turned into Red Sonia at 79. Uh, a great four-parter, 82 through 85 where it starts with Black Widow, goes to Nick Fury, Shang-Chi. Great, great story, man. I oh, love that. And it's all Chris Claremont's writing, too, yeah. which I didn't realize it. Uh, my first exposure to uh, Guardians of the Galaxy at 86. Not, you know, a lot of these were kind of meh storylines as they kept going on. But as I went backwards, that's where a lot of the fun went in. I mean, you look at 69 and 70 was kind of a big conglomeration where – Havoc was fighting the living pharaoh, so you had to have the obligatory footnotes, the last scene, or they fought in this issue. And then, of course, yeah. the Beast took off from this issue into X-Men, where he went to go uh, the Death of Phoenix storyline. And yeah. then, of course, Thor yeah. showed up and and all these different great characters. Eventually, I, I, you know, I went back to issue number 65, First Appearance of Arcade, first time I got exposed to Captain Britain. And, of course, Arcade showed up later in X-Men. Uh, and the, the cool one for me was when I finally found Marvel Team-Up number one. Again, now it's pretty common to find, but back then, X-Men were hot, super hot, real hot. And I jumped on X-Men uh, at the death of Phoenix issue, which was in, I believe, the 80s. I don't believe it was in the 70s. But... I knew of them because of this particular issue. So the whole world of Marvel opened up because as I would pick up a uh, comic, I would be exposed to a new character. Again, Warlock, maybe yeah. you know, number 55, Spider-Man Warlock. Uh, there was actually a, uh, a thing later on. I don't know if it was that issue or a different one. Oh, where, uh, what, I don't know what they call her now, but back then her name was Her the female counterpart to Adam yes, Warlock. Yeah. And they went to it, they had an issue where they went and they went to where they buried Adam Warlock originally and she resurrected him, but there was no soul. Yeah, I remember that issue very very specifically, yeah. So they put the live body back in the ground and walked away. To this date, Adam Warlock's live body is still sitting on the moon. I don't know if it'll decompose or whatever. You know, Starling could have brought it up when Infinity Gauntlet started, but they, they, he went through a different way of getting Adam Warlock back. But, I mean, it was just so much fun to go back and discover things. Uh, nowadays, half the time I'll, just, you know, I'll see a character and I go, huh, whatever happened with her? And then I go to Wikipedia or whatever and find out. But, I mean, I can't tell you how crazy it was when I first realized, uh, what was it, Roxxon Oil was doing shenanigans, yeah. not only in Marvel Team-Up, but over in Marvel... Two and one and some other ones. I was like, oh my God, does anybody else know this? 
Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it reads Marvel Comics, but just amazing stuff. And uh, I di- I never did finish the run. Fortunately, through uh, the essentials, I've been able to read it, and it's hit or miss depending on what it is. But I don't even know if a book like Marvel Team Up and its counterpoint, Marvel Two and One, could exist nowadays. I know they're coming back with Marvel Two and One, but uh, what a great way to showcase the Marvel Universe, bring back characters. I mean, the uh, travel story around the 40s into the 44 where he, he was with moon dragon doom uh dr doom he went forward to see kill raven yeah which, and it was fun when they uh they brought him back in the in the avengers he was like spider-man it's just been a month and he's like ah it's actually been years <laughs> so just a wonderful thing deathlock that was the first exposure i had to deathlock and then of course he shows up in marvel 2 and 1 and then you realize he showed up in captain america I mean, the marvel universe was just just wondrous back then because of just all the different crossovers and they all combined. It was, a, you know, for a kid reading this continuity matters. I know nowadays it's, it's not hip to say it does, but back then in, in when I was reading these, it actually was a lot of fun. And uh, like I said, it was just a natural, maybe that's why I got so hip on the Marvel universe because you, you start with amazing Spider-Man and you just picked up uh Marvel two and or Marvel team up, and of course Peter Parker was out that time as well. You know, I forget the issue where uh, Spider Man shows up as the, right after the Champions broke up. Well, that's how I found the Champion series. You know, so yeah, yeah. We do another. It was just a lot of fun. You know, it's funny because the Marvel team. Uh, when I look at my top ten list, there I, I one of the I was talking to Curry uh, Corey earlier about number ten of which you know. Yeah, I was having a hard time figuring out what, uh, what to put in my number 10 spot. And one of the candidates was the Marvel team up run, particularly when Claremont was writing it. And it's because exactly what everything you said there is just, uh, team ups were such a big thing back then. And then you get to learn about these characters that you don't normally learn about. So I think that's one of the things that made the Marvel Twin One and team up so, uh, attractive to us because you got to see these characters that you wouldn't normally get to see. Then I also like the fact that when Claremont was on it, he was using certain issues to tie up uh, stuff that he didn't get to finish in other issues when Power Man and Iron Fist got canceled, and he couldn't finish what he started there. He just went ahead and finished it up in the, in the Marvel team-up series. But uh, that came close to being in my top ten. I guess what kept it was just the inconsistency, but everything you said about it is true. And I don't think the book would go would, would have the 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 attractiveness that it did back then, just because back then team ups were a big thing. Now you just see it all over the place. I mean, you see it in the Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe so much. It's just not that big of a deal now. I care. The first ones that I picked up were actually that four parter that became in what, like a seven or eight parter with Spider Man traveling through time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that with the Dark Rider. Yeah. Yes. And I'd always heard that Marvel Team Up was a throwaway book. Yeah, you know, the little group of people that I was with in junior high and high school where it, 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 we called it Marvel Throw Up. <laughs> because it's, oh, yeah. you know, here's this crappy story, here's this crappy story. And then I finally pick it up and it's like, oh, wow, they're using Doctor Doom's time machine and they're going here and they're dealing with this. And I got hooked, you know, until after Claremont, it seemed to become the uh, one issue wonders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I stopped. Yeah. But until then, and before that four parter, it was really one issue wonders. But once it got into you know continued stories and continuity and building on things, it was like this is awesome. Um, the next book on my list is a DC book. <gasps> I read some DC back then. Heretic. Well, yes, it was uh, Steve Englehart and Marshall Rogers on Batman. That's on my top ten list, too. I talked in the past about how creators would just vanish, and it took me years to figure out, oh, yeah, they went and worked over at DC. So when Steve Englehart vanished from everything, it was like a year or two later when it's like, oh, he went and he did some Batman stuff. And out of all the, you know, Batman comics were worthless back then, except for those. Yeah, yeah, exactly, I agree. Those those cost money. And there's a really 
you know, real simple reason why. He did the best Batman stuff in a long time. He made the Joker scary. He um, really kind of made Bruce Wayne interesting. And Marshall Rogers' art was just off the charts amazing. Yes, I agree. Everything he did I loved. But that run, I know they've reprinted a few times, and it's kind of grown in reputation to where now Steve Englehart is, well, you know, the Batman movies were based on my run of that. Well, kind of little, sort of, you know, bits and pieces. But, yeah, whatever. You can have that. But still, that... I think the 70s Batman is due for kind of a resurgence. Because you had all that Neil Adams stuff. And then, now that I've read it, the David B. Reed, Irv Novak stuff was actually really good. You know, it was very much a Julie Schwartz edited book, but it was still well worth reading. And much more interesting than than a lot of the other DC mainstream stuff at the time. But man, that Englehart and Rogers run, it yeah. really felt like a Marvel comic in that the stories mattered. Things changed. Um, the characters were moving forward. They had much more personality. Just, I, and the, I can't go on and on about the art enough. Marshall Rogers just did a beautiful job on that Batman run to the point where anybody who came afterward just didn't seem as cool. Yeah. Well, to show you how long, to show you how, uh, uh, how much the, that, uh, how important that book was for its time is about 10 years, well, a little more than 10 years ago. Maybe I'm talking 15, 17 years ago, something like that. I do remember doing, uh, I do one convention a month, so I do all these conventions. And I remember there was one point where they were had uh, they were having the uh, a tour, almost like a tour throughout all the conventions, where it was Inglehart, Marshall Rogers, and Terry Austin. They're doing this tour through all these conventions just to sign those books, and you don't see that that often. And I'm thinking, like, here we are, years, I mean, decades after that uh, '70s run came out, and these guys are actually doing a tour. I'd never seen that before until then. That these guys, they got these three guys together, and they were just going from convention to convention signing all these books. And I can't say enough good things about Terry Austin's inks. The fact that he's not working in comics right now is a goddamn crime. Yeah. You put him on anything, and he elevates the art. Yeah. So, Angel, what's next on your list? Okay, well... um I was going to go to the Batman and Marshall Rogers one, but that's higher on my list. I'll talk to that a little bit. My next time on my list is my final Gerber entry, which is the Defenders by Gerber and Sal Buscema. And the reason I have to is because, first of all, as you can tell right now, I'm a huge fan of Gerber. So he was going to make my list no matter what. Plus, whether it be you or anybody else from who bought comics from at that time, every time we bring up this guy, we get into long discussions. It doesn't matter who it is. And so that's come as a big fan of him. I had to finally put that down because out of all of Gerber's works, that is my favorite because what he got to do in Howard the Duck and in Omega, it's almost like he got the chance to combine that all together in the Defenders and at the same time handle a group of superheroes in a superhero fashion that was, you know, still thrown in with the quirkiness of what Gerber always would throw into his story to begin with. And then I also have that on my list because, as an artist, the art affects my, uh, affects my choices. And my, uh, I have five artists who affected my style of drawing more than anyone else. And one of those artists is Sal Bissima, particularly his run on The Defenders, because not only do I think it was that some of Sal's best artwork, but the combination, when it got the combination of Claus and Chanson and Salvi Sima, that to me, the artwork looked absolutely spectacular. And not only did it look spectacular, but it fit in so well with what Gerber was doing with the Defenders at that time. That the uh, We could talk about every single storyline that he introduced in that, whether it be with the, with the Bozos or whether it be like a, when Valkyrie was in prison, any of those stories or the elf storyline, and we can just talk for hours on each one of those stories of what Gerber was doing and where he was heading with all of that stuff. One of the things that I have with Claus Jansen is on a lot of books, his inks overpower the artist. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with but that. But with Salbi Asema, he knew when to pull back. So 
you know, I could look at a book that Klaus Janssen inked, and there are times when I don't even know who penciled it, other than maybe I recognize the layouts. Yeah. But he knew to pull back and let Sal's just sheer storytelling style drive the bus. Yeah, yeah. Well, Sal always had this very simplistic style of drawing to begin with, and so I think one of the... I talked about this many times on uh, Facebook when we talk about Klaus Janssen. I always thought Janssen's work tends to look better on the very simplistic artist. I hated seeing his stuff on, let's say, like John Byrne or uh, John B.C., you know, where you really wanted to see these guys' artwork more than anything, but then Klaus would come and overpower them. Whereas someone like Sal, it was simple to begin with, so he already had the skeletal structure there, and so it seemed like on a simple artist like Sal, he added a lot more depth to the simple storyline, but you still got the power of Sal's, like, action poses and, you know, the wide uh, mouth expressions and stuff. And and it's also just, I think, pure, um, the stars were aligned at that time, too. Both those guys were doing some incredible work on both ends of their stuff, and it just seemed to really coalesce at that time. That was a real crystal moment for both those artists, I think. I agree. And I... I'm glad to see that Sal Busem is getting a lot more recognition because there for a long time he was doing great work, but he was just kind of ignored. Yeah, yeah. He was like, he was the artist who, oh well, yeah, he puts out a book. He puts out two books. He puts out three books a month. He's, yeah, you know, he he's a workman like artist. Yeah, yeah. And while he has certain things he does, he does them because they work. Yeah. I can't tell you how many artists I've talked to who the uh, somebody punching the, a character and the character is flying at you, that they steal that pose as often as they can because they love it so much. Yeah, I've stole that pose many, many times. One of my uh, favorite memories, as a matter of fact, in this industry was I was at San Diego Con the year that uh, uh, Sal won a Lifetime Achievement Award. And he did not expect it because he, you know, he knew what his reputation genuinely was back during the time. He was John's younger brother all those years. And when he got that uh, achievement award, it was such a surprise for him. I remember after he got the award, I went to go, uh, I saw him in the hallway and I went, went up to him to uh, congratulate him on it. And I couldn't do it because the guy was just in tears because he was just so, you know, honored to have gotten the award. So I just figured, you know what, I'll just leave the guy and enjoy his, his time. I get to say, I've gotten to know Sal over the years, but uh, so I got to congratulate him later. But that was just so great to see an artist like him. And he actually got this award and got the recognition for it. Yeah. Joe, what's your next book? Uh, uh, you want to go DC or Marvel? It's up to you. It's your last. No, no, no. We're going to make this interactive. What do you, what do you want to do? Well, I did a DC. Why don't you do a DC? Yeah, All right. let's hear a DC one from you. Yeah, because, I, again, I, I didn't have a lot of DC in the 70s. I picked up DC probably more as we went into the 80s. And I do remember, uh, even as an early collector, feeling bad because... I tried to buy Superman comics, and they just were terrible. Oh, and I, I agree. Knew Superman was the reason why comics existed. I mean, I had a lot of fun when I had my shop when Image was popping up, telling kids, "Well, you know, you owe your your Image comics to Superman." No, no, he's a square. I said, "No, no," because he's the reason why you have comic books now. Not yeah. that kids cared. You know, they just wanted more cross hatching. But for me, what better one to jump into than Justice League of America, and I started at issue 161. And let's go ahead and ask the Strode. Are you ready, Corey? Yeah. Who joined in Justice League of America 161? Hmm. I have not read those. I do know that it's right after Engelhart left, so I'm going to say Gary Conway. Ah, why not? He was in the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, well, he's uh, 161. Well, of course, one? having a self-congratulatory uh, chuckle. No, this was when Zantana showed up in her body stocking with cleavage, a ponytail, and a big old red cape. No fishnets uh. for her. Yes, yeah, I agree with you. But I didn't know. I was a kid. I, I, again, how I knew who Zantana was, I have no idea. I just realized who she was. Get all the characters in here. 
Uh, give and me that number again. I want to look it up on the air. I want to look it up. Uh, 161 came out in okay. December 78, or at least that's the cover date. And this led to a couple crossovers. She ended up joining at the end. Uh, I kept going forward. You had the Secret Society of Supervillains show up. Uh, again, a lot of... Uh, uh, footnotes to their series, which I never picked up, although I just picked up the hardcover reprint. Uh, it kept going forward. The The other one that was interesting was the first JSA crossover was the death of Mr. Terrific. And that got me to go back to pick up World's Finest at the time, where I believe that was their home. And, of course, the villain got away f in the story. They ended up killing Mr. Terrific, the villain got away, and then I read the next issue of World's Finest, and it had nothing to do with the fact that Mr. Terrific died, and they're on the back on Earth 2, and the Justice Society didn't do shit about it. And I'd have to go Wikipedia to figure out how they eventually resolved the storyline. Or was it a no, Adventure Comics? I forget what it was. Whatever it was, it was unforgettable. Or forgettable, either way. Uh... And you keep going. I mean, it turned forward. out to be that. Uh, I think it turned out to be that they found out Mr. Terrific wasn't all that terrific. It, it could be. And uh, yeah, Despero show up, and Martian Manhunter returned. And whenever anybody returned, it was always last seen in Justice League America. And then I had to go back and figure out what to begin with. Firestorm showed up, and that got me to go buy Firestorm. And of course, eventually, my first exposure to Dark Side. And I thought he was just the biggest fucking wimp on the planet was when they crossed over again with, I believe it was 183, the, the annual JSA, JLA crossover, and they brought in the new gods. And everybody was all upset about the Justice Society. Dark Side was there, and the Injustice Society was there. And Dark Side gets defeated by Firestorm shooting his Omega Beams back at him. What a wimp. I didn't realize how <laughs> I could be until he showed up in Legion of Superhero later. And then, I, of course, much, much later when I started to to uh, go back into uh, Justice League. Because I, as I kept going back, you'd go back and you'd, you'd see them fighting Mordu. You'd see them, the JSA uh, crossovers were always fun. I actually ended up scoring the first two. I believe it was, what, 21, 22, way back once upon a time. Uh, I, I got the Earth, Earth S appearances where, you know, him and Shazam fought. I picked up the, the big fight between him and Superman Earth 1. And, of course, I, I, I stumped Corey with this one years ago. But Superman of Earth 1 met Batman of Earth 2. But did Batman of Earth 1 ever meet Batman of Earth 2? Now, I remember the answer to this. Wait, what do you think, Angel? I don't know. I don't. I wasn't reading it at it. So. Probably weren't bad. You didn't miss much. No, they never did meet. Oh, and dude. that was that was in the last issue of Brave and Bold where they brought up the point that that the only time they never met, or the only two heroes that never met at, at this, they they crossed over a lot, but it just so happened when Batman Earth Two was with the Justice League, Batman Earth One was nowhere to be found. Probably off in outer space somewhere. I don't know. But, I mean, you go back, you found Earth X, you, you found Red Tornado, Seven Soldiers of Victory. I mean, this, this was like a who's who of the DC Universe. Yeah. And this is probably how I became more aware of the DC Universe. Plus, anytime you grabbed a 100-pager, you had all those sweet reprints in the back. So, uh, Justice League of America is one of those books I, I, I keep with, I drop, depending on what's going on. Corey brought up a good point a couple podcasts ago. If you're going to have the Justice League, you got to have the big guys in it. you got to have Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, uh, Flash, Green Lantern, and then if you want to throw in Cyclops, fine. But, uh, or Sarah, whatever his name, Ceratops, I forget. Cyborg. <laughs> Million Dollar Man. <laughs> the pro wrestler, Steve Austin. Yeah, he'll, he'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How about Velociraptors? Oh, Can you put Velociraptors in there, oh, too? Yeah, it was a time when, you know, Gorilla Salt. Let's get some dinosaurs going there. We can't let the <laughs> challenges of the unknown have all the fun. Oh, my God. Gorillas with machine guns on skis. <laughs> well, the next book on my list is another Steve Gerber book. Uh, yeah, the famous baby food. 
yes, they they actually on the bullpen bulletin page would call him Steve Baby Gerber. Yeah, a uh, man thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Man no, thing was uh, your man thing sooner or later. <sighs> yes, it's always it always comes down to my man thing. Not only was man thing where Gerber kind of learned his storytelling style. Yeah, yeah. And I reread it like about three, four years ago, and I was. The early issues are just very clumsy. Mm-hmm. It's very much like like a teenager learning how to write. But by the by, about ten to twelve issues in, he'd finally figured out what to do with the book, how he wanted to write comics, and he had some incredible artists along the way. Yeah, you know, John Buscema drew issues. But the vast majority were either by Val Merrick or Mike Plug, yeah. both of which were just perfect for that feel of a, a gooey swamp monster. Just, you, you go back and read it, and there's a mood to it and a beauty to the art that wasn't there in other Marvel books because it was. Other Marvel books were set in cities. And this was very much of the swamp, very much of the Florida, New Orleans sort of vibe. You know, he and had a... Gerber was... He, I don't mean to interrupt because of what you... I, but before you get off that, I think... Uh, what I, I just read the... I, I just reread the essentials on this about a year and a half ago. When you're talking about the swamp, what I, I like about it is when you talk about most others were in the city, it didn't seem like he wrote these stories like whatever happens in the swamp stays in the swamp. Yeah. Yeah. And as as he kept as he kept working on it, some of the stories he threw out there were brilliant. Yeah, like Song Cry of a Living Dead Man. Um, the we Joe and I joke about Giant Size Man Thing as everybody mm-hmm. jokes about Giant Size Man Thing, but Giant Size Man Thing four and five were just fucking brilliant yeah. comic books. Yeah. they they were so far above what was being done in comics at the time that. You just your mind just kind of boggles, not just at the stories that he was able to pull out of this very cliched setting, but just how he grew as an art as a writer through it, and how Val Merrick, his art wouldn't have worked on any other. You know, you would have you wouldn't put him on Spider Man, you yeah. wouldn't put him on Thor, but you put him on Man Thing, and it's like this is beautiful stuff. I'm actually kind of surprised Tom Sutton didn't do some stuff because his art perfect, really yeah. would have, yeah, would have fit that sort of style that didn't exist anywhere else in comics. I love Bernie Wrightson and Len Wein's Swamp Thing, but that was a very different book. That was let's take a tour through all the horror creatures, whereas this was more let's take a tour through how horrific human beings are, yeah. and. You know, you talked about how Defenders is your definitive Gerber. This is my definitive Gerber. I love everything he's done, but when I think Steve Gerber, this is the series I think of. He just owned that character to the point where I don't think anybody else can do the character justice. I, I agree. I agree. Totally agree with that. I didn't include him in my list because he was also that that ten spot for me where I was trying to figure out what to yep. do with and the reason I, I decided to keep him off my list is because I didn't want to have to keep talking about Gerber because I would have had all of Gerber's <laughs> stuff on my list. So I said, well, if there's one, it was just a man thing. But it was because of what you said there. That's where he was uh, learning his craft for writing. And all. Angel, what's your next book? My next book on my list, let's see here, is Iron Fist by Claremont and Byrne. And that's just because I got that on there because... Uh, uh, you'll see what a big fan I am of the teaming of Claremont and Burr. Uh, I've talked about it, I think, on your uh, last couple of times I was on your podcast. And uh, that, to me, when you're talking about how Gerber was getting his feet wet on uh, the, in the swamps of the man thing, this is uh, the team of, of Claremont and Burr getting their feet wet together as a team, which was on Iron Fist. I recently, I, I reread uh, the essentials on uh, Iron Fist a lot, and the reason I do that is because when you see the first couple issues where they had uh, different writers and different artists, and they couldn't really find, they were just, you know, uh, trying to cash in on the whole martial arts phrase at that time, but there was really no direction for the character himself until Claremont came on board, 
And then it started to solidify itself more when Byrne came on board, and then they started to gel together as a team. And all the stuff that you're going to see later on in the Claremont Byrne run and the X one that made them so famous, you see a lot of that starting up here in the uh, Claremont and Byrne run of uh, Iron Fist. Uh, probably not Iron Fist, but I, it started more with the Iron Fist thing. You even see some of the character stuff they started in Iron Fist finish in the X-Men later on. But you start to see that here. And when I read those essentials, and when you see from the beginning how it's just this really ho-hum character, but by the end, you, you get to the end of that uh, book, the essentials, the collective, you just see a big shift in the storytelling and in the continuity and the way the whole thing just flowed. I re you really get excited for some of the uh, concepts that Claremont was about to start, but he could never finish. I remember there was this Irish character that was started, and they, he never got to finish it, and getting so excited to see, oh, I would have loved to have seen where they were going with this. So I got that on my list just because that, to me, is the beginning of the whole Claremont burn uh, stuff that started, uh, that continued on in Marvel Team or, and finally crystallized in the whole X-Men run. And because I think that's a lot better written than most people um, give it credit for. I can't, I, I, it's amazing how I keep reading that over and over again. I read it like every two years. And by the time I get to the end of that story, I just say, wow, this is such a great, uh, such a good written series that it's just so sad to see it uh, get canceled. That was canceled way before it was uh, given any real time to grow and to get into. I, I'm curious. I would have loved to have seen that series just continue and get better and better. And I think Iron Fist would have become a much richer character had that team been able to stay out there. That's about as underrated a book as I could possibly be to you right now. And that was Hungry John Byrne. Yes, yes. Byrne... Byrne is one of those guys that when he's hungry, when he's wanting to make a point, he can knock it out of the park. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, There's one and he was knocking it out of the, the park where, on that, man. Where, uh, it starts out with a splash page, and I, I, where you just see uh, Iron Fist, and behind him it's a, you know, um, wanted Iron Fist. And, it's just, and you look at that page, and it's just beautifully drawn by Byrne. I look at that, and I go, man, this matches any of the stuff he did later on in the X-Men or in the Fantastic. Superman. Joe, what's next on your list? Well, I'm going to wax on the Defenders for a while, but I didn't jump in uh, when uh, where you guys were talking, because my first issue of the Defenders was the uh, issue number 62, where they put out a call to be a Defender for a day, and so everybody and their uncle showed up at the great Defender issue, compound. Man. I know, and it went into the next couple ones. Again, a great way to be introduced to tons of characters I probably wasn't even aware of, including Power Man and Iron Fist. And uh, from there, I kept going forward. Uh, issue 70, of course, was uh, Versus Lunatic. And I want to wax on one of my favorite runs of Defenders, which started with issue 78. Uh, the, the defenders basically broke up for whatever reason, uh, you know, being a non-group that they were. A Nighthawk just, just declared, we're not doing it. It's over. And then Hulk, Submariner, and Doctor Strange got together and traveled to Tunnel World. In Tunnel World, they fought a villain named, well, he was unmentionable. He was kind of an unnamed one. And it was almost like a Dungeons and Dragons type feel. Uh, the issues were just, the storyline just, I, I don't know, I'm trying to figure out who wrote this thing. Ed Hannigan, Herb Trimp Art, beautiful. And at the end of the issue, they defeated the villain by, he retreated into the Hulk. Now this is the classic Hulk, you know, Hulk smash, green, purple pants guy, before he started creeping out into, you know, 21 different variations of Hulk. Doctor Strange went into the Hulk's mind, where the unnameable one retreated, and physically separated the brain cell that the essence of the unnamed one was in. That's how they defeated him. To this day, that essence is either in the Hulk or has been escaped. I keep saying, Marvel, if you want a world-class villain that has roots back in an early comic, you've got one right now. 
Because you can't tell me that this thing is still inside the Hulk's head after all the different changes and his death and Secret Wars and and all the different blue, gray, green, you know. I just keep thinking if they can mine this one, you got yourself a great crossover that, you know, a world-class villain so powerful you can't even mention his name. They had to stop him in Tunnel World. They did. Well, guess what? He's loose now. So... For me, I always waited for that return of that particular villain because I just the storyline just captured my imagination even to this day. Uh, nope, I, I talk to I, I tell Bendis, I, I tell I tell Miller, I tell uh, 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 Wickman. No, nobody wants. They all got their own ideas. <sighs> I'm telling you. But in the meantime, you went back again in Defenders, like I did from that '62 back, and you you discover the the first appearance of Lunatic. Yeah. Uh, I ran across Omega the Unknown in, in the bad, uh, you know, whatever. And you kept going back farther. Submariner was part of it. The first Gerber run I got, I actually got from my guitar teacher. It was issue number 32, which had the origin of Nighthawk, the Kyle Richmond version. And I believe that was, I also had the goofy, uh, what was it, 31? No, it was 31 because it had those headmen in there. The one woman that had the the globe as a Easy head birthday, yeah. yeah and uh <laughs> the clown was in it too and uh from there i was able to go back i i was able to to get the defenders part of the uh the defender war uh, it took me a while to get the avenger side of it i i figured out who valkyrie was which is kind of cool nebulon and then of course you went all the way back and where you found the, what was it the megatron I know yeah. they killed it, but what a, again, for a kid, that was like a pretty heady concept. Uh, you know, this countdown computer, and we stopped it by putting it in, oh, just, just crazy stuff from Ingo Hart. And then, you know, later on, uh, as I started reading through the Gruber, Gruber stuff, I, it was just, just a lot of fun. And Defenders was something that I hung on to until it ended. I picked up some of the different series that popped up afterwards. Uh, never, you know, it, it got fun again, kind of in the nineties, you know, they, with Jay Matias was doing some stuff, you know, I think one of the things that was cool was they try, it was, uh, they brought in Ghost Rider and Dr. Strange had to team up. And of course they were both wary of each other because of the, the fight they had back in their respective books, which I had already read. Anytime I ran across continuity, continuity like that, I always felt like I was part of a club. Like I got that i knew yeah. I was, yeah it was just a lot of fun it didn't matter if it was like captain america fighting just a guy named joe well he appeared last way back in spider-man or Pun you know he was he was so happy to meet captain america until he got the shield across the puss you know just you talk, all these little things in there just a lot of fun uh, Defenders was also, you know, part of that. I jumped on a lot later than you guys, but fortunately through reprints and back issues, Defenders is still one of the collections I have to this day. I will probably end up selling it on the Ebays because I do have it in Essentials. I've already sold off the, uh, was it Marvel Premiere they were, they were first in? Yeah, yeah, yes. It's a couple runs. Again, if you have it, it's silly money on the interwebs. So keep yours in good shape. And, you know, you don't find them in great shape. Back then, I didn't care. I just wanted to read the damn thing. If I happen I to have every, one, it makes it so much better. I've got every single issue of uh, Defenders up until the, uh, the issue you talked about where they are or, you know, if you want to become a Defender. But I've got every single one of those issues. I could never sell just because they're such a big part of my childhood. Oh, yeah. Fun stuff. And for me, I, I'm getting cranky i don't know uh if we get a chance to talk about it but uh i i've been picking up a lot of the omnibus just to pick up these things because i'm tired of trying to read them in comic format you know it's like i yeah. i got my howard the duck sitting behind me don't have number one i know i had it don't know where it is don't have the kiss issues i'm like a part of me thinking did you sell them no i don't recall selling them i mean for me getting that number one was a big deal because spider-man was in it so but as long as they're available either that way, less fun with Marvel Unlimited because I, I still like to just sit down and, and read the physical format. But they're available, and that's half the fun. Next book on my list, Master of Kung Fu by Doug Mensch, um, Paul Galassi, Mike Zeck, Gene Day. 
Come on, um, buddy. Love hey, it we so got much. an award for you. <laughs> Sounds like the Academy Awards. <laughs> Love it so much that Joe and I are doing an issue by issue commentary Which of it. Is the first time um, I've ever read these. Again, I knew who Shang Chi was because of the Marvel team up, but never. I, I, I started reading it towards the end run, like maybe the last ten issues. Yeah, and they canceled too. a lot of books like that. I think Dracula got canceled, uh, Ghost Rider got canceled, and and this one was that way too. And they could have just let the character go. I think the hard thing, I think the hard thing was just they didn't know what to do with his pajamas. Yeah, <laughs> you can't have a shirtless Chinaman running around New York anymore. <laughs> Nowadays, yeah, there's a guy out there in shorts playing a guitar for money. But back, you know, in the, in the, never mind. But this was another book that kind of flew under the radar to a lot of people. But I remember it winning awards because on the bullpen bulletin page it would say winner of the Shazam Awards or winner of the Eagle Awards, and we didn't, I didn't know anything about that stuff. So wow, it must be good. And in a lot of ways, as I'm reading it, it really you know it started as kind of um, Steve Englehart and Jim Starlin doing Bruce Lee movies while throwing in Fu Manchu because, well, we got the rights, what the hell. But very soon, Mensch turned it into a spy book, and it got into the idea of a reluctant hero, which wasn't something that we'd had a lot from with Marvel. I, Joe and I are, you know, as we're going through, we're getting up to the point where he starts to talk about you know, the games of deceit and death where he sees all of these things all of these things that he's being pulled into are going against his inner nature and the characterization is very rich but then you have Paul Galacy whose art just was you know he's very quick another guy who very quickly went from very static poses to man yeah. he was phenomenal with his layouts and everything and then you had Mike Zeck, who was good on his own, but he was being inked by Gene Day. And then when Gene Day took over, they, it's just even better. Gene Day's sense of design on a comic book page, decades ahead of time. I still look at that stuff and uh, just amazed at how Gene Day would lay out a page and how he would have all these symbolic, symbolic things and the way he would use the panels to make it more cinematic and just he a lot of artists will pull you through the page he grabbed you and drug you and you had no way of controlling how fast you would read that book he was the master of that with especially with his use of deep shadow and his pages almost look photo referenced ah uh, gene days i remember when i heard about gene day passing this was what, like 81, 82, somewhere around that. I was still in high school, and it hit me just as hard as if I'd heard that, you know, some some rock star that I admired had died. Gene Day was that big in my consciousness. And rereading these Master of Kung Fu's, again, this is a book. It's not as great as I remember in the issues that stumbled, but the good issues are better than I remember. I haven't read that in, like, forever, so I can't. I, I don't remember. But getting back to what you are talking about, the artwork, I, to this day, I think the, the, uh, Zach's artwork is the best it's ever been, even his later stuff. I still like that earlier stuff, and I agree with you 100% on Gene Day. I think that's some of the most underrated artwork out there with Gene Day's run on, uh, on the Master of Kung Fu. I have yet to read his um, Star, Tra Star Wars book, so I hope it's, I know that it's not going to be as experimental, but I hope that it's just as good. Angel, what's your next book? Uh, let's see. We just talked about Iron Fist. I, I'm, I'll, I'll make this one quick because you already, you already talked a lot about it. Next on my list is The Batman by Marshall Rogers and uh, written by Steve Englehart. And that was, that to me is so high on my list because when I was a kid, I mean, you know, all of us hardcore Batman uh, fans back in the 70s, especially the early 70s, 
we all pretty much wanted Batman away from the 60s camp that had stuck with him for such a long time. And it was still stuck with him even during the 70s. I remember when Neil Adams started giving um, Batman that more um, gritty, down-to-earth, realistic look. There was still a lot of the the camp still being injected in it, against probably against his will, with the exception of that Raphael Ghoul story. But, uh, it, you know, you wanted it to really get away from that. And when Marsh, when Inglehart and uh, Rogers came on that book, they they were pretty much doing what every hardcore Batman fan wanted to see on Batman at the time. And Marshall Rogers' artwork, as you said before, that literally changed my life on that book. So much so that um, I did a show one time in Kansas City, This is when, and uh, Marshall Rogers was supposed to be there. And when the guy picked me up at the airport, he said, listen, we got to go pick up two other guys. Their flights are really close together. And I can't remember who the other guy was, but one of them was Marshall Rogers. So I said, well, why don't you go pick up the other guy? I'll go to the gate where Marshall Rogers is supposed to be at, and I'll pick him up there, because I just thought, oh, I got to pick this guy up, you know? <laughs> and uh, a funny, a real quick funny thing about that, though, is uh, I didn't know what Marshall Rogers looked like. And so as I'm standing there uh, waiting for people to come out, I just thought, wait a minute, I don't know what this guy looks like. And me being the, the, the dip that I am, a guy comes walking out, and he had a cowboy hat. And I just thought, oh, wait a minute, Marshall is in, you know, you know, Western Marshall. I thought, that's got to be him. And I went up to him and said, I go, excuse me, you Mr. Ross, Marshall Rogers? And it turns out it wasn't him at all. <laughs> and that's then when TSA I get some, was formed. Yeah. Keep people like you so on the airport. And so then, uh, anyway, when we did find Marshall, um, I took him out to dinner that way because that's the way I, uh, I, instead of being a fanboy to all the artists, all the creative people I grew up with, rather than fanboying out, I, I learned that if you just take them out to dinner, they're not going to turn down a free dinner. And then you get to talk about all the stuff you want to talk to, but on a much more casual level, and you let them bring it up. Cause shop is always, and when you let them bring it up, you actually get to hear the real nitty-gritty as opposed to if you come off as a fanboy, then they're going to give you the stock answers that they give, you know, used to give them, like, amazing heroes. Oh, he was a real joy to work with. I want to hear that. I want to hear the real nitty-gritty about, you know. <laughs> Jim Shooter was a real asshole, or, you know, that type. <laughs> and so I took Marshall Rogers out to eat, and that was one of the best dinners of all the artists I've gotten to take out. He, that was one of the best dinners because, when he saw how much I knew of his artwork, because Marshall Rogers in that Batman and the Doctor Strange run, he filled it in the background with chock full of little details in the background. You really had to study his artwork, and you would find these little things happening in the background that most people wouldn't pick up on. When I took him out to dinner and I started bringing these, I could see the look of shock on his face because, one, he still remembered it, and two, I don't think anyone ever came up to him and started pointing out, oh, you know how you do this in the background, or how you do that. And he was so shocked to see that I knew that, that he literally would start drawing on his napkin and say, you see how I laid out that one page where I did this in a circular motion where you read that whole page, your eyes were forced to go in a circle or whatever. And that was one of the most, when you talk about one artist talking shop with another artist that he looked up to, that was the moment for me. We stayed there in that restaurant for like two hours just talking about his artwork and all the stuff he was trying to do with Batman and um, Doctor Strange at that time. One of the greatest times I ever had with any artist, and it came all from that book. I, I can't understate to you how much I, uh, I mean, I can't overstate to you how much that book Batman meant to me, because that was the Batman I wanted to see, and this was back in the 70s, when you didn't get to see it all that much. As a matter of fact, I always tell this to people, this was Batman being done if Marvel had done Batman at that time, but Rudo Hart and Rogers yeah. were doing, they were doing what, they were doing everything that I wanted to see in the Marvel books, but now we will get to see it in a, in a DC book, which was Batman, and just even the inclusion of them. Um, Silver St. Cloud as love interest. That was one of those points when I mentioned earlier how they Marvel, when they would introduce a new character, and you could tell that they're really, this is something, a new direction this character is going to go. With Silver St. Cloud, that was one of those uh, characters where you really wanted to see Batman's relationship grow with her. And you never got to see it because, you know, that run got short. 
But I always just thought, man, uh, you know, everyone talked about Batman's loves like Catwoman or uh, uh, Vicky Vale. For me, it was always a uh, Silver St. Cloud from that run. And then another thing yep. that they did that um, that was very Marvel-like is that they were taking these villains and putting them in really kick-ass cool costumes. They took Clayface and they put him in that really cool uh, armor-type costume. And they took Deadshot and they put him in that really cool silver and red costume. I remember looking at it and thinking, man, this is what I wanted to see. And all the DC books happened is what they were doing with Batman. I got Marshall Rogers' picture wearing the championship belt. <laughs> that used to be my thing for a while back when Polaroids were around. I, I remember talking again to uh, Maggie Thompson, a buyer's guide, saying, I don't see pictures of anybody, none of the creators. And so what I would do is I'd, I'd take their picture, holding the belt, and then I'd have them sign the uh, Polaroid when it came out. So I got their signature and I got their picture. It was always fun because the old guys would wear it around their waist, and then oh, the yeah, young guys yeah, yeah. would always throw it over their shoulder like, you know, the, the cool guys were doing now. So yeah. I got quite a few guys doing that. But my next one, and, of course, by the time this here podcast drops, depending if this is going to be a two-parter or not, we'll, we'll know who The Last Jedi was. But way, way back in 1977, we had no freaking clue we'd be talking about Star Wars in, in the year 2017 even though Lucas did say there were like 12 more parts to the story or something stupid, and obviously he was full of shit. But back then, the first one I picked up was number four, and I still have it. I slabbed it in an incredible 2.0 because I read the living snot out of this thing. The issue I, I saved because I actually bought it off a spinner rack up in Ely, Minnesota, where my grandpa had a cabin, so it kind of has... Uh, sentimental value for me but back then i remember when i read it i picked this up uh, my cousin was with me he said oh you don't want to read about it yeah but it looks cool no see the movie first because he had seen the movie i thought the movie was going to be lame old ass suck quad because uh you know what did i know they went from big nine inch gi joes to little tiny three inch star wars this thing's gotta suck you know which you know pretty much is how i you know had my luck with comics that have gone up in price what the hell did i know but I was able to go back, find number one, and I just kept reading forward. I can't tell you how much fun the Marvel Star Wars comic series was between the end of the movie adaptation and the beginning of Empire Strikes Back because they kept going forward with the storyline. You know, the first one, of course, we followed Han Solo off to the planet where we met, uh, what was the name of the big old? Jackson, the rabbit. How can you not like yes. Jackson? Why? Why? Lucas, why did you banish him to... Well, he came back, but... You know, they, they were pretty much fast and furious. We just followed along what everybody was doing. When uh, uh, Han Solo's story was done, we kind of jumped on where Princess Leia was doing, and then uh, we followed Luke. He ends up getting into a Jawa sand crawler and bumps into, of all people, Han Solo, who's hiding out from Jabba the Hutt back on Tatooine. And... Uh, they answer some questions like, uh, yeah, they go try to find a new uh, planet, which makes sense because they had to get off that bloody moon. The Emperor knew they were there. We didn't know about the em Emperor. Well, we heard of the Emperor. We didn't meet him, but the Empire knew they were there. So they, they all packed up and they all went. Uh, there was a uh, – I remember being gobsmacked when Luke – I'm sorry. Darth Vader was torturing a Jedi uh, – a rebellion guy. See how excited I am. I can't get the story straight. And he gave up the name Skywalker. So I can't. I was like, oh my god! I can't believe they just told Vader who blew up the Death Star in a comic book. And then they had they they finally had the face the face to face we've been waiting for, where they had their lightsabers drawn. And yeah, there was the uh, what was the Alan Dean Foster book, Splinter of the Mind's Eye where they actually had faced off before. But this was actually them facing off, and there was an actual duel between Luke and Vader, and they, they basically broke off. And then by issue 39, there was the movie, movie adaptation. Of course, by the time we sat down to see in the movie, and it was a tough choice for me in the 80s because I had to decide, did I want to see that or go to school? I did see that. But when Return of the Jedi <laughs> came around... 
I had to go. What, because... what, what, what school oh, got you since then? So. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but, but see, when Return of the Jedi came, I, it was go to my graduation for high school or go to the movie. Yeah, well, my mom involved in both. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We, that, that's the 80s. We'll talk about that when we get there. But this whole run was just great because we, it, they could have easily just made this is the story that happened in between the two movies. Or, you know, Things fell into place. And, of course, you would mentioned our good buddy who draws with the T-square, Carmen Infantino. He pretty much did 90% of the artwork. But it was fun. And the only real thing that was weird is that you wonder, you know, isn't Princess Leia ever going to change out of those robes? Don't they ever <laughs> change clothes? But for those years, from the end of, uh, let's see, I'm trying to find the date here, issue 6, which came out in 77, all the way up to uh, Empire, which was uh, in the 80s, that was it for Star Wars. You know, you, you didn't have, you had the one book, and uh, it, it didn't really, you know, have the big march of merchandise like we did or we do nowadays. So for me, that again, that was probably the most fun I had with a, a Star Wars comic. Current ones, uh, hit or miss. Uh, the original run that Marvel started was pretty good until they got away. They decided to go away from uh, the core original group and wow we're going back to tales of the republic no forget it forget about it i'll come back when you uh bring back vader and company so just a fun run do not own it i did have it in dark horses reprint classic star wars and my girls read them to pieces i mean literally so somewhere or another i gotta pick them up i don't know if marvel's reprinting them or i, I don't know are they on marvel unlimited or are they is it yes okay so i have access to them if i do need them well, they're very popular reads because I go on these fan books, uh, fan uh, groups on uh, Facebook, and they come up a lot. I wasn't that much into the comics, way into the movies. I wasn't that much into the comics, but I'm surprised how uh, when I go on these fan groups, they're, they're a very popular read for a lot of the hardcore fans. And even after Empire, I kind of lost win because they, they, they really by that time I think Lucas tamped down on Marvel, and while the art improved about a hundred percent over Carmine. It didn't, the stories just were kind of, uh, just kind of like they were treading in place. And they were, there's the, the famous story where they came up with the idea, well, why don't we build a second Death Star? And Lucasfilm, without explaining, said, no, no, you can't do that. So they ended up making a giant weapon to go after the Rebellion. And we're kind of like, boy, that, and even even me reading the story, it's like, why don't they just build another Death Star? Well, then when you get to <laughs> Return of the Jedi, you discover why it is. Well, the next book on my list is the uh, DC book that I was talking about. And yeah, we talked earlier, when you go back and read these, it's, oh, that's my favorite. And this is one that really hasn't gotten a lot of attention, I don't think. And it deserves a lot more. And that is the Manhunter series by Archie Goodwin and Walt Simonson. Yeah. And it was a backup in Detective Comics when Detective Comics became a 100-page uh, giant but it was probably the first idea of a mini series because it was a series that started as a backup and then led up to a story where the character teamed up with Batman. That was the end of his story. There is a um, very small trade paperback that has a, a story that Goodwin wrote and then Simonson drew after Archie Goodwin had died. But all of the stuff that you like about Thor with Simonson's art is right there. The big, expressive panels, the massive action, along with Archie Good Goodwin's um, taking the idea of Paul Kirk as Manhunter from the 40s has been resurre resurrected and cloned. And this is in the 70s when cloning really wasn't mainstream idea. You know, Kirby had used it, but this is all about the art. It's all about Walt Simonson kind of showing up and saying, look, I'm here and I'm here to kick ass. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think because it was at DC during one of DC's periods when it wasn't getting a lot of fan attention that it's not remembered as well. But I, I ran across the trade paper that back this weekend and sat and read it. It's like, this is a kick-ass action story 
that has a lot of um, philosophical implications. And it reminded me just how good Archie Goodman was as a writer. Because when I think of Archie Goodwin, I think of his stuff at um, Epic. I think of his stuff at um, the Warren Mags and how good he was as an editor. He could get yeah. great work out of people. But he could really sit down and write a great story, too. Angel, what's next on your list? Next on my list is, and you had mentioned this er, uh, before, is uh, Swamp Thing by Len Wein and Bernie Wright. This was, uh, when you were talking about the man thing, the thing that got me about the Swamp Thing and the man thing, which are these bog monsters from the swamps, is I like how the fact that once you create a bog monster, whether it be Marvel or DC, you realize there's a really, you're really limited on what you can do with these stories because there are bog monsters. It seems like these uh, swampy type monsters are probably more suited for a, a B movie type, um, uh, for you know the B for our film for B movies. And when these guys both created these, uh, when both companies created these characters, it was almost like the creators were forced to think, well. We can't just keep writing the story about these swamp creatures. We have to find something to do with them. And it seems like both creative teams decided, well, we're going to take these, and even though they're based on these swamp creatures, and just go this route that you really couldn't see them going into when you, you know, were first uh, introduced to the idea that there's this creature that's made out of, a monster made out of swamp material. I remember when I was a kid and I first saw the idea of the swamp thing, thinking, oh, that's such a boring idea. And the same thing with uh, the man thing, oh, that's such a boring idea. And then you read these comics and you just think, like, holy crap, these comics, the least thing that they are is anything but boring. You know, I remember talking to one of my best friends. Uh, I've been, I'm still, we're still best friends to this day, but when I first met him back in the 90s, I used to live in um, Lincoln Park, which is north of the downtown Chicago area, and that's where all, I lived there because I wanted to, uh, you know, hang out with uh, the other artists at that time. People like Alex Ross and Hilary Barda and those type of guys. We all used to hang around together. My best friend would just come in on that. We were talking about the Swamp Thing. And my best friend, uh, he's a hardcore Italian guy. So he talked very hardcore Italian, like from the city. In other words, what you would see in the movie Saturday Night Fever, that type of thing. And so you're excusing my French here, but I always like the way he described the, the Swamp Thing at that time. He said, the reason I like the Swamp Thing is because it seemed that as fucked up as the Swamp Thing was, each issue he would meet someone who was more fucked up than he was. <laughs> and that's how he described the Swamp Thing. And I said, yeah, you know what, you're, right. you're really right about that. And so when... Uh, I had heard about the Swamp Thing, but I didn't come into contact with them after, remember when they reprinted it not too long after? It was the first print, and uh, Bernie Wrightson was doing those wraparound covers. Yes. yes. And those wraparound the DC covers. DC Special. Were, yeah, those were just amazing. And the artwork inside was amazing. And so the reason that's so high on my list isn't just the fact of the, the writing and whatever was going on with the whole uh, Swamp Thing mythology, but at the same time, uh, Bernie Wrightson, to this day, is the number one influence on my artwork, more than anybody out there, and it all stems from those first couple of issues I've seen of the Swamp Thing. When I saw the artwork on those things, literally, it changed the way I started drawing artwork, so for me, it's a very personal thing, that the reason that's so high up on my list is just the fact that it affected me to the point where I even changed the way I was uh, how you drawing? And to this day, uh, Bernie Wrightson is still my number one guy. I almost, I literally found myself almost crying when uh, when uh, Wrightson did pass away, and I wrote a little homage to him on my Facebook page, and that was really hard for me because I really, it really did feel like a huge kick to my chest. Just the fact that now I'm going to be living on a planet without Wrightson there, and uh, uh, I mean, just, I mean, even talking about it now, it's hard for me to talk about that, but uh, that's why that's so high, high on my list, just because that, that was one of those game changers in my life that, in a way that I can't even describe to other people. If you come up to me and see, uh, and say, you know, what's the one of the 
most important book in your uh, that's ever come into your life. Not just you know comic books, but books in general. It was definitely the Swamp Thing during that period. And, and I mean, the fact that Alan Moore took it to a stratosphere much back in the '90s, sure. But this is what started that whole thing was the Swamp Thing back in the '70s by Wing and Wright, and the fact that story-wise and horror-wise genre, and then art-wise, the whole comic book, the whole horror idea of horror comic. Uh, just changed with the Swamp Thing itself. I mean, you talk to anybody out there and they talk about horror and comics, and you know the Swamp Thing uh, by rights is going to come up at one point or another. And it's also the fact that it was so well done. I, I can't ever see them coming up with any other, uh, you know, movie or film series ever based on the Swamp Thing because uh, there's no way it had to capture what they did in comics back then. And the other... One of the important things about Wrightson, and you mentioned it a little bit, Wrightson is one of those artists that other artists look to and go, that's the guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, he was never a guy who drove sales, but if you talk to artists, there are certain artists that they always point to and go, he's the guy. Yeah, yeah. Michael Golden's another one of those yeah. that artists point to and go, he's the guy. Yeah, he's the one that literally, that if you, I don't care what, how big of a name you are as an artist, you meet these guys. And you're literally on your knees saying, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. That's always, that's what Ratson and Golden and those guys are going to be. They're, the, they're those guys that no matter, uh, you know, what artist out, I don't care who you look up to, you, you put them in front of those guys and they're going to get down on their knees and say, you, you know, you, you're God. Yeah. And he really didn't do a lot in comics for someone as popular as him, but he did a lot of stuff outside comics that uh, Stephen King tapped him to do art for one of his books. Yeah. Um, he had that deep love of the Frankenstein novel where he did he did uh, art for a version of that novel. It wasn't an adaptation. It's, no, I want the novel with my art in it. Yeah. You know, it's funny because... And when I look at... Oh, go ahead. When I look at Wrightson, yeah, I really appreciate what he did. I really like his art. And for me, looking at him, it's like, oh, I could tell he worshipped Graham Ingalls yeah. back at EC. Yeah. And he did more of a, I, I think, a smoother version of Graham Ingalls' sort of drippy, oily horror where... You know, if you read Graham Ingalls, you need to take a bath afterward. Yeah. <laughs> and Wrightson did kind of a cleaner version of that, so you didn't feel as grossed out, but you still got that feeling of, this is just creepy. Yeah. Well, when you mentioned it, even no, go ahead. that um, that's Doctor Strange reprint where he did the, yeah. the yeah. Um, wraparound cover, yeah. that's still the creepiest thing I think Marvel's ever published. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. He was when you mentioned the fact that uh, he didn't do that much comic book. Or one of the reasons why I I look at him as such a god in the medium is because when I first saw that comic book of the Swamp Thing, I thought, "Holy crap! This is some of the best artwork I've ever seen in my life." And little did I know that when you venture outside his comic book stuff, you get stuff that's even better than that. I mean, way way better than that. And that you know. Uh, I've done a lot of interviews during my career, and I've always brought up the fact that the most important possession, physical possession that I own, is a, a hard, is a limited, a hardcover edition of a Look Back, which is just a collection of Bernie's artworks, artwork from like the seventies, mostly from the seventies and before that. And to this day, I mean, I got and I got that signed by right. So to this day, I mean, I've told my girlfriend this before, is that if the fire, if the house ever caught on fire. I, I, to, I always tell her, I go, listen, uh, if the house, house comes on fire, first thing I'm going to save uh, in, in, this, in, my, in the house is the Bernie Wrightson book. So you got to try to hang on until I get that book out of the house. <laughs> and then I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, what's next on your list? Uh, something we talked about before, and I, I talked a little bit about X-Men. Now... I came late to the party. My first issue was 19, 19, 137 in 1980. So I was there for the death. However, I was well aware of the X-Men because of 
previous encounters. Like I said, an Amazing Spider-Man, Marvel Team-Up, and in no run, I should say in, in no short order, I was able to get a pretty impressive run. I also remember uh, 135, you know, came or had those three packs, and 135 was in it, so I, you know, I busted it open because I just wanted a 135. I didn't want the, you know, other ones with it. <laughs> yeah, I was able to find most of them. I think I got back as far as 109, and after that, it gets blurry because I know I've owned them at one point in my comic shop as well as uh, at at uh, various other times. Uh, if you go back to one of the solo Joes where I talk with uh, my old partner, Pat Gruber, he talks about how he helped my mom pick out an uh, X-Men. Oh, what was the first modern X-Men? 94 oh, for a yep. Christmas gift. And uh, because I'll, you, you should have seen my face when I open it up and hear from my mom is an X-Men 94. How the hell did you know? To pick this up. Well, she talked to Pat, and that was one Pat suggested. Uh, I don't have any in my collection. I mean, they, they've gone, come and gone so often. Uh, ones I've, I remember, I do remember Pat borrowing me his run to read. So even though I only got back to like about 110, I was able to read the whole thing and know what was going on. My first X Men comic I picked up was X Men 123 in 79. Because it was the beginning of the murder world, and it had Spider-Man in it. And I opened it up, and I'm like, oh, wow, Spider-Man's in it. Cool. So I picked up 123, and I picked up 124. No Spider-Man. Well, <laughs> screw you, X-Men. I ain't picking you up anymore. <laughs> so I didn't pick them up until uh, the, uh, the aforementioned. Uh, and there are a couple, two other issues I'll, I'll mention, because I did pick up number 35, which again had a Spider-Man appearance in it. I remember going back to the original Schindler store down on E-Block in Minneapolis. And what it was, my ma had a doctor appointment in the the uh, IDS center at the time. And I took the Skyway over to E-Block and basically sat in their bins digging through tons and tons of old comics. I mean, if I was a time traveler, I'd go back there and say, just give me this entire bottom roll. Because of all the old X-Men comics there, the one I picked was 35 because it had Spider-Man in it. Uh, and, you know, this is back then. This Again, 78 or so. You know, you're just buying this stuff. They hadn't really gone up in price. I remember one of the comic guys, Twin City Comics, had a sale where he had had a huge collection of somebody... I, my guess is that it had to have been a fire because all the plastic was literally melted together, but it didn't damage the comic. So to read the comic, you had to rip the plastic open, which was almost sacrilege to a kid. And this was long before poly bags were big. But, you know, I, I, that's where I found Captain Marvel, Marvel side, Miss Marvel, all the other characters that I've been exposed to through all the different Spider-Man books. So, you know, this was one I picked up. And I did pick up, I was a proud owner at one time of an X-Men number one, all the way back in 63. For 150 bucks, that was my Christmas, no, actually that was my uh, gift for graduating high school. I, I got a bunch of money and I was going to do that. Or for 150 bucks, I could have bought a Carl Barks lithograph. <sighs> I tell you, if I, if I, I mean, the lithograph now is probably worth tens of thousands of dollars. My X Men comic is probably worth some money, but again, it was probably in fine shape. Years later, I remember trading it to some guy who gave me a ton of Golden Age, a ton of Carlton, like, you know, Space 1999, $6 million man, that type of stuff. And I hung on to those, and then when the Golden Age comics exploded, I sold those. Uh, but yeah, I did. I did own one at one time. Now, of course, I have uh, the modern X Men run in omnibus form. It's actually anchoring down a portion of my desk here, so it doesn't fall over. And then the original run I have in in either Marvel Unlimited or I do have the Essential run because nowadays they're way beyond any price I could have. And you got I got to admit, those early ones, uh, they, yeah, they were okay. I mean it. I can see why they, they kind of disappeared and dissipated 
But the new the new run, starting with ninety four, was pretty cool. I have never owned a giant size number one though. I've had plenty of reprints, but that's the one comic I've never had. I I actually have had multiple copies of Hulk one eighty one, the first Wolverine. And you know, you were talking about Iron Fist earlier. If you remember in was it one oh nine or one oh seven? Uh there was a there was a reference to Sabretooth that got me interested in Iron Fist. It might have been because it was it was like, oh, this one's going up because it's the first appearance of Sabretooth and he's an X-Men villain and John Byrne did it and blah, blah, blah. But that's how I got turned on to the Iron Fist series, just by, you know, different types of crossovers and things like that. So X-Men, uh, again, my first issue was in the 80s, but I was able to pick up that 70s run before it got impossibly expensive. And now, of course... Yeah, you could probably buy the omnibus way less than even a single issue of one of those bad boys. <laughs> oh yeah! <laughs> if only I knew. <laughs> and they, they always talk about what would yeah. be the two, three words you'd tell yourself if you could send something back to your younger self. Don't yeah. sell anything, especially <laughs> number one hundred six because that had an awesome ad with Spider Man and Madam Web for the uh, Hostess Twinkie ad in it. Man, I wish I had that. Now. I wish I had some Twinkies. I just, oh. You all saying you do that. I, I remember all those bands. I know. Ain't they great? If I owned Hostess, you know, because they, they went out of business, they came back, or even Marvel, I would have contacted Hostess and said, hey, as part of your revival, let's make a reprint of all these great ads you had and, yes. you know, make it, send away five box tops and get it free or whatever. You know, just, I'm telling you, nobody talks to me for this. There's money on the table I'm getting. I, I'm just upset. Corey, Corey, what's your next book? And I, uh, my last book is the book that you mentioned, Joe, X-Men. I The first issue of the X-Men I bought, well, actually, I didn't buy. I was in the hospital over Christmas break because I'd uh, fallen down a flight of stairs and broke my jaw. Do we want and my family that? brought Are me... My family brought me a bunch of comics, and one of them was Giant Size X-Men number two. And I fell in love. It's Roy Thomas and Neil Adams' X-Men story. Great stuff, though. Oh, I know. And it's, you know, the, so the next time I was able to go to the grocery store, oh, i got to find the X-Men. i got to find the X-Men. I want to read more about this. And there was X-Men number 100. And I'm reading it and going, who the fuck are these yeah. guys? And why are they fighting the real X-Men? <laughs> but they hooked me, and then I got 101 and 102. And by 103, I'd actually scraped up the money to get a subscription. This was when it was bi-monthly. And Dave Cockrum, I don't think his art was ever better than on those early Oh, I agree. I, I, I absolutely agree with that. And then he left, and John Byrne came on. And at first, I was like every other comic fan. Who hey, the John, fuck uh, is this guy? Uh, <laughs> he is ruining this comic. <laughs> he brought in a bunch of damn Canadians. <laughs> but then, you know, they had the uh, the Savage Land story. And by then, he was, you know, firing on all cylinders. And the X-Men became the greatest comic during the 70s for me. I could not wait for another issue. I loved the characters. I devoured them. Um, there were a few I had to go out and buy another copy of because I'd read it so many times it was falling apart in my hands. That's back when you could still, you know, oh, well, it's still on the newsstand. I'll just go buy another one. And I... It, it's one of those things where... At the time, you know, when it was starting to grow, it was like this little thing. My friends were like, X-Men? Ugh. It's not as cool as Spider-Man or Hulk. And really, from what I've read, it wasn't until after Byrne left that it became the number one selling comic. Yeah. Which um, Byrne still pisses and moans about every chance he gets. <laughs> Well, in my neighborhood, it was the hottest thing at that time. As far as comic book goes, I remember uh, everyone. I mean, I in my neighborhood, I had to go race literally 
I, I bought my comics from a, a place called Wheels Pharmacy, and I literally had to go racing to the pharmacy like 20 minutes before they opened because that's the only way I could get that issue because they were really a hot item back at that time in my name. Yeah. And still the build up to the death of Phoenix, you were reading it and you had no idea what was coming. Yeah. And it felt like the story had been going on forever. And I, I really don't think any of the creators did better than from like X Men ninety four up until about X Men one fifty. I don't. I think for all of them that was their peak work. Yeah. And I'm not saying that they peaked early. I'm saying that it was one of those things where the whole was better than the sum of the parts. And when I think 70s comics, you know, back then as a kid, I was in love with it. I go back, yes, Claremont was very overwrought with his dialogue, but still, the plotting and the the story construction and the art was just top of the line. And to me, it's kind of a shame that Terry Austin didn't just stick with John Byrne. I don't think anybody ever inked Byrne better, including Byrne. Yeah, I agree. Austin... Austin really, Austin added the background detail that Byrne doesn't really care to do. Um, he humanized the figures and brought this wonderful kind of sheen to the art that no one else was ever able to capture. And I think if you were reading comics back then, if you, you know, if you were a fan, this was your book. Angel? Okay, well, before I go on mine, um, you said you're on the last one on your list, right? That was the last one? The yeah, because if you guys mentioned a book that I like, I just crossed it off, so it's up to oh, you okay, guys okay, now. Okay, well, because I don't want to keep on um, this going, because I'm, I've got, I still got three more on my list, but I can skip over the two. Yeah, I'll, I'll do the same. I, I was looking at the three I got left, and I just, I picked, I actually thought of a fourth one. Oh, well, yeah. So we'll go, we'll go, let's just finish her up and, uh, you know, no reason we can't do this again someday. Okay. All right, then. so then I'm going to skip two of them. I'm going to skip my number three and my number one because you talked about them already. My number three was uh, Warlord by Jim Starlin, and my number one was Excellent by Claremont and Byrne. So I'm going to go ahead and skip those two and talk about my second one because you don't hardly see anyone talk about that. Is that okay, then? Oh, yeah. Sure. All right. Uh, my second one on my list is the Avengers during the Shooter and Perez era, but there was a lot of uh, uh, in-betweeners coming in. Englehart wrote a couple, and uh, Gary Conway wrote one or two issues, and then Perez was, like, doing every two issues, and then they'd fill it in with someone like Sal Buscema, or then they'd fill it in with John Byrne. But I got that run as uh, my second favorite because uh, that series during the 70s, number one, there is no higher peak in the Avengers for me other than that run right there. And number two, as a kid who got into comics primarily, well, let me first say this. I, know the, I, I had a couple of friends who were comic book fans, and some people, if you notice, some people get into it more because of the collectability. I had a good friend in, uh, in college who got into it more. He got into it for the collectability, but also for, for, you know, for the financing. And it was hard for me to have conversations with this guy because I'd always talk, well, well how about this storyline or here's my favorite character and he couldn't care about it. He was more about trying to, like, well, I got this issue. You know, I got the full run of this issue or whatever. So you get to find out that fans, there are different types of fans. And I got into comics you know, basically just for one reason, and that's for writing and drawing superheroes. That's the reason I got into it. I never really did get into uh, comics with, you know, the, uh, the cartoon stuff like the Donald Duck or any of that other stuff. I got into comics just for superheroes. And for me growing up as a kid, there was no book out there that epitomized the superhero genre better than Avengers during the 70s because... This book was titled on the top of the Avengers. It said, "We're the world's mightiest here, Earth's mightiest heroes." And I always thought, well, you know, that really should be a tagline that goes with the Justice League of America. But they didn't handle the Justice League of America as the world's mightiest heroes because they had a hard time writing stories for really super powerful. And what you, what I wanted to see in the Justice League, I got to see in the Avengers. 
I remember there was a run that started right after one issue 50. Actually, the run really kind of started right before that when the Avengers fought the Squadron Supreme. And from there on in, all the way up to uh, getting close to uh, 200, it almost seemed like every issue was just Earth's Mightiest Heroes fighting some of Earth's Mightiest Villains. And and they were handled in really, I mean, the story on that and the continuity in that series was pretty damn good, especially for the hopping around that you would see. And for the couple, you know, they had a couple of filling issues in there. But still, overall, they did a great job of having these characters with these um, uh, running storylines and with these characterizations that you didn't get to see in other issues. You got to see this, uh, you know, Captain America having these, uh, you know, this power struggle with having Iron Man as the leader of the group. You got to see Wonder Man questioning his uh, his ability as a superhero. You got to see Wonder Man have, forming a friendship with the Beast that you never got to see anywhere else. You got to see all these things going on, and at the same time in between it, it was the Avengers fighting Graviton, and they were fighting Count Defaria, and they were fighting, you know, the Squadron Supreme, and they were fighting uh, my, uh, Michael Korvac, the enemy, some of the most powerful villains in the entire galaxy. And the Avengers were the way. No other words, the Avengers were taking care of business. They, the reason that the Avengers formed, you really got to see it during the 70s. And with some of the greatest artwork ever. Pablo Marcus, who was inking most of all that stuff, he really made Sal Buscema's artwork shine. He really made George Perez's artwork shine. He had uh, Burns. Artwork was really shining through that. Really great story. So that's why that's second on my list is because no comic book when I was a kid epitomized the whole superhero genre for me better than the Avengers did during the set. And Perez kind of became a huge superstar from this. Yeah. His run started with Vince Coletta inking yeah. him, and it was like, I don't know if this guy's... Uh, why are they putting him on the Avengers? Once Coletta was gone, it's like, oh, that's why they're putting him on the oh, Avengers. Oh, yeah, because right after that, that was that Garden Supreme story. It sucked horribly. But in that same storyline, once they got rid of Coletta, and it was Stan Granger who got on that book. And I always remember Stan Granger because he was the very first professional inker who ever inked my stuff when I first got into this business. But it was weird how uh, once Granger got on there, suddenly Perez's artwork just shot up into the stratosphere. And you just saw, I mean, that was about as comic book artwork as you could, uh, that was going on in the business with uh, George Perez's uh, run. Well, and he also was working on Fantastic Four at the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. So Joe Sinnott's inking him, and you're going, is this the same guy? Yeah, yeah. And he also, you know, it's funny because Perez did a lot, was famous for doing group book fairs. I remember he also did a really good run on the humans there for a while. Yep. And also, I picked up Manwolf because he was drawing yeah. it. But yeah, that was a great run. It's one Joe brings up a lot. Well, you can tell it's my favorite because I actually had a story. letter printed in the letters page. In one Ooh, of them. Really? Yeah. I, w I will have to dig up my issues and read yeah, that. Yeah, I know. Like the, Is it embarrassing? Uh, yes, it's very embarrassing. I was just a kid. Good! That's the best part. <laughs> Joe, what's next on your list? Uh, the, the honorable mentions will go to... Uh, well, first of all, it was Marvel Feature that had the first Defenders, not the uh, Marvel Premiere, which I said. So I had Marvel Premiere on my list because uh, just, again, all the different properties that they tried and things like that. Uh, I was going to mention Brave and Bold. Uh, again, I started, I think, at 145, which came out 178. It was a Phantom Stranger story, and I liked Phantom Stranger because of his popping up in JLA. And it was another way how I got exposed to the DC universe. But And I'm a little surprised I didn't think of this one. Right away, whoops, dang, I just erased it. Um, Superman Family. I tell the story about uh, I was on vacation and I had a choice of two magazines. I could have picked up Superman Family, number uh, 185, or Kiss Super Special, printed in real Kiss blood, which, again, I found out from... Uh, 
the rock and roll issue comic of back issue number 101. You cannot tell the difference between first print, second print. So you don't really know if you have blood or not. It's only in the first print, by the way. Um, I chose to go with uh, Superman 185 because you know, I had a very stylish cover of a, a uh, Jimmy Olsen with some type of power gloves. They almost look like Luther ones, although those are years in the future. Kicking the bejesus out of Superman with, uh, let's see, Lois Lane, Nightbird, uh, no, I'm sorry, Nightwing, Flamebird, Supergirl, Perry, and uh, Superdog watching on. And again, this was the dollar comics, if you remember the DC dollar comics. So you get a big, thick book full of stuff. I think the other ones I picked up at the time were All Out War and uh, Time Warp. Never did pick up Super Batman Family for some reason, but the Superman Family I just loved. I mean, I gotta admit, I had a four color crush on Supergirl, but it was the Super Dog story that I gave up the Kiss Super Special for, and then I went back and got it. But as I was reading this, I was able to go back and get to 182. After that, they were mostly copies that were 100 page giants or 80 page spectacular. They would have a new story. And then a bunch of reprints. And again, the reprints were gold because that, that taught me all the different stuff going on. But going forward in the in the series, you always had these stories. You could never be sure what was going on. We found out later, again, through, I think, a back issue book, a lot of this stuff were things that were going to appear in the back of, like, Superman comics and things like that. But for me, it was just a smorgasbord of just wonderful, wonderful stuff. There was like a time when a villain on Earth 2 beat Superman of Earth 2. And then he came over to Earth 1 and he beat Superman of Earth 1. And then Superman of Earth 2 and Earth 1 had to get together to make a giant Superman, a phoenix of steel in order to defeat this <laughs> villain. And of course, the word balloons inside were the two talking about how it how things are going and how they, you know, Superman Earth 2 was worried about Lois Lane and and Superman of Earth 1 was saying, come on, con concentrate, we have to de defeat this guy. Uh, there was even a couple small talks about, you know, you really should get married. It was world, it was really good, you know, because obviously that wouldn't, that would never happen to Superman in, in Earth 1. Uh, a little bit later on, uh, it was Superman Family 190, at the Museum of Eternity, where everybody crossed over in one big story. And it was just uh, amazing. And, of course, you, you look now, and it's a who's who of writers and artists. I mean, Kurt Schaffenberger, Whit Mortimer, uh, E. Nelson Bridwell, Tom DeFalco, Gary Conway. I mean, just wonderful stuff. Uh, they had like the private life of Clark Kent where they introduced some of his uh, cousins that we didn't know about. Uh, you could just never tell what would happen. But eventually the the inventory stories wrapped up. They dropped Superdog, which I was kind of bummed about. It brought in Superboy, and I, I don't think Superboy was in any book at the moment. And then after that it became pretty – formulatic you would get a jimmy olsen story you get a lois lane story you get a superboy story you get a supergirl story and it did that way all the way through the end of the run uh where did it end up way up in uh 222 and but again i got introduced to all these characters i mean night nightwing the original flame bird stories about how well they got these costumes from way back when jimmy olsen and superman used to appear uh you had the first human run of the human can first appearance of the human cannonball, Ryan cannonball, Chase. Yeah. Uh, there was an uh, actual reference to a super friend story. There was a, uh, I can't think of the character who was being held in, uh, uh, what was the bottled city? Candor? Candor, Candor. And he was there because he would blow up otherwise, and his first appearance was in Super Friends Family. So Super Friends was now canon. Oh, <laughs> didn't make me buy it, but the point was it was canon. Uh, there was one character that kills me. There was a, a chunk of red kryptonite that Superman flung out into the netherworlds. And it got to the edge of the galaxy. There was this big multi-eyed, multi-limb character. And it found this red kryptonite and was holding up in his hand. And Superman came flying by and grabbed it out of his hand. And the thing was watching. And, of course, they said, 
we may see this bizarre creature sometime later. Never did. Never did. I'd bring him back in a heartbeat. Screw this crisis, Final Crisis, Dark Side, all these anti-monitors. Man, you got this guy at Superman Family. I'm giving you guys all these stories. Look at the Defenders one. Look at Superman Family. Where's my payback, baby? I want the Ultraverse. Oh, forget it. I'm done. Anyways, that was, you know, it, it. what was fun about this whole thing is oftentimes when Corey and I talk about old comics, I stop and I think, I have no freaking clue. How did I know about Justice Society? How did I know about Earth 2? Well, this has actually brought me down memory road, and I'm remembering it was because I read books like Justice League of America, uh, the crossovers that that Marvel team-up did, the Superman family where they brought all this stuff in and they, they introduced to me. And there was always the obligatory as seen and issue, blah, blah, blah. So actually that was one of the stories here too. They, they talked about how did those Super Sons stories come about what happened was the superman was all upset because he was like he was wondering what would have happened if his parents never met and so he used this device that him and batman once used to figure out what would it be like if they ever had sons and of course the crypt of the, the footnote now you know where these world finest super son stories came from it was batman superman using the device again they always tied up little continuity and uh they found, as, as the story went on, you know, it ends in one issue where Superman's, it's, it's quite apparent that his parents, Jarrell and, uh, what was Superman's mom's name? Bad with the oh. trivia here. Not Martha. Shut up. Um, <laughs> anyway, he's all bummed out they never would have met. And next time he dons the machine to find the answer, he discovers, oh, it's his mother. She was always the stronger of the two. She was the one who initiates the date that gets these two together. Now, again, this is classic Superman, not these the, the sterilized Kryptonians that we'll see when John Byrne did the run. So they're running around, and, you know, Superman was pining to be in, in Krypton, not Earth, you know, whatever. But that was just part of the mythos and the way it went. So, anyways, I just, I, this has been a blast. By the way, his wife's remember? name is, uh, Carol's <laughs> wife is Lara. Lara Croft. Thank you. That's right. LL. How could we not? Again, that was a big thing, too. Where did all these LLs come from? Who? Fun stuff. You know, speaking of that Superman family, uh, I do have a few. You know how so there's certain comics you just never let go of because you know, I got a few that I had since I was very little, like, you know, seven or eight. And one of the few comics I still own from when I was a little kid was uh, Superman Family number 194. And I own, and I still own that one just because there's a really cool uh, Nightwing and Flamebird story, which they were just basically Batman and Robin. They ended up yeah. bopping, you know, on Candle. But uh, there's a really cool uh, story in there by uh, Marshall Rogers, drawn by Marshall Rogers, of the artwork in this thing. is about as beautiful as anything you saw during a uh, Batman. Oh, Joe Stanton did a story in there, too? Don Heck? Yeah, 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 with uh, yes. Superboy fighting the magic kid. They, some guy was made out of magic or something like that. Yeah, when the sorcerer yeah. strikes. And, you know, I yeah, was a yeah. dumb kid when these came out. And now I look back and I love these because it's like this was a who's who of who created, you know, the, the Silver Age, some back to the Golden Age. I didn't know. I was just plunking my dollar down and enjoying the hell out of it. Yeah, me too, yeah. You know, I told this story I'll, I'll share with you. You know, I had a copy of Shazam number one. And I know who Captain Marvel was. I mean, I, I read the, the reprints, the crossovers, and, of course, there was this show on, on CBS. But yeah, I was yeah. at a, a convention, and C.C. Beck was there. I know who C.C. Beck was. So here I am, you know, I'm probably 12, 13-year-old little kid, standing in line waiting to get uh, his autograph. And he turns on me, and he goes, hey, you got the comic. What do you think about it? Did you like it? And the, my little fanboy brain went, ah! <laughs> <laughs> and I must have babbled something. And then years later, as I'm reading a column that uh, Maggie Thompson wrote in, in Comic Buyer's Guide, uh, that was he was probably thrilled that, hey, here's a kid reading this thing. He wasn't even around when Shazam was created, and it's still going yeah. strong. And, of course, I was just... Ah! <laughs> I still have that, too. I still found... I found I do have that comic that he had autographed to me, so... 
other than my brain screaming, I must have said I actually gave him my name because my name's in there somehow. <laughs> I react that way whenever I see Angel. <laughs> I I do too, but I'm at the airport usually, so I try not to scream when I'm there. Well, it's funny. Well, you know, I suppose they might get it's mad. It's funny how I still go to you know you know I'm a 52 year old man, and there's a certain point where you know you realize how things really are and stuff like that. I mean, when I worked on Kiss and I got to meet Gene Simmons a couple of times, there's a certain point where you look at it and go, you know, yeah, when I was a kid, I used to buy those albums. I used to draw Kiss logos on my notebook and stuff like that. And then you meet the guy, and after a while, you talk to him, and I just saw him actually in April. I was at a show at Knoxville, and he was there too. And I remember when he came by my table, he goes, hey, you know, how's it going? And I go, hey, you know, and then he walks away and and that's literally the extent of it. You don't really think that much about it. It's not like when you were a little kid. Oh, fuck, there's Gene Simmons. There's Gene Simmons. And then I go What's to San Diego. There's a red thing on the floor. Oh, it's Gene Simmons' tongue. Let's follow it. Yeah. And then, you know, then I go to San Diego. And I remember the, the last time I was at San Diego, I was um, talking to a bunch of fans. And uh, as I was telling my story, Hugh Jackman came walking by. And everyone stopped to look at Hugh Jackman as he walked by. And I was more annoyed because I think, well, I'm in the middle of a story here, and you kind of kill that flow. You know? <laughs> and so then, so then I, I start the story up again. And, I, you know, I'm still, you know, I, I continue going on with the story, and everyone's probably. And then Charlize Theron comes walking by in the other direction, and the same thing happens again. So I'm waiting for, you know, their excitement, and they die down, blah, blah, blah. So then I continue with my story. Now, this was a long story, so it's going on and on. And then um, <laughs> Jennifer Connelly walks by, and the same thing. And I'm getting frustrated here. But, you know, this is San Diego. Con you see all the stars at these things. And so then after Jennifer Connelly, as I continue my story, I finally finished my story. But as soon as I finish, Marv Wolfman comes walking behind everybody there. No one turns a single head, but he looks over their head, and he waves to me. And he says, hey, you know, and I don't know him as a friend. I just know him. I met him a couple of times. But then he says to me, Angel, what are you doing for dinner afterwards? And so I tell him, and he goes, well, listen, we're going to meet at a lobby, blah, 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 you know, meet us there. And, so, and then he walks away. After he walked away, one of the fans turns to me, and he says, uh, wow, you must really look up to that guy. And I, and I go, what, what do you mean? He goes, well, when um, Hugh Jackman walked by, you didn't flinch. When Charlie Theron and Jennifer Tommy, <laughs> you didn't flinch. But when this guy, he goes, your whole body posture changed. And the way that you were just talking to that guy. And then that was the first time it hit me. It was like, well, what you were talking about, Joe, is that uh, you realize, you know, I can look at someone like Hugh Jackman or Jennifer Connelly, and I think, well, how they're big, these big movie stars, but how have they really affected my life? I just, you know, the only way they affected it is they helped me escape for a couple of hours. You know, I go to their movie or whatever, and I'm escaping them that thing. I forget about them. But then I see someone like Mark Wolfman. And that guy literally changed the genetic code of the way I'm going to lead my life because it's people like him and Bernie Wrightson and all these guys that made me get into, you know, that made me decide, okay, this is what I'm going to do with my life. I mean, and it affected you guys too because, I mean, look at the age that we are and we're sitting here having a podcast talking about this stuff back in the 70s. Yeah, so that's the way it is now. I can't. I don't get easily starstruck by all these famous people or anything. But to this day, you still, you know, George you know, Perez comes walking in front of me or Marv Wolfman, and I can't. And even though I know that, you know, now you get to know them and you see how human you are, but there's still that part of me that still says to myself, you know, it's it's they still have a certain godlike quality to them. You know, Bernie Wrightson was yep. like that. I never talked to Bernie Wrightson because. My patience with Bernie, Bernie Wrightson as a man was pretty war, pretty thin with that. Not that he was bad, but he was just someone I could never connect to. But still, he was still that artist that you know is, is you know that affected my my artwork more than anything. You know, so it's almost like you know, yeah, I, I got to see Bernie Wrightson the man, but Bernie Wrightson the artist that's still like a level above the rest of us as human beings. I. Completely understand what you're saying. I was talking with uh, one of my high school friends recently, and he, you know, was he was a guy who really loved music, learned how to play guitar and everything, and now he works for one of the guitar manufacturers. And he says, "Oh, you know, and I've met this guy and this guy and this guy. You know, he's trying to impress me." 
And all I could think is, yeah, you've met all these great musicians, but to me, I've had conversations with the people I admired as a yeah. kid. Don McGregor and I talk routinely. And in my mind, it's like, oh my God, this is Don McGregor. Yeah. He's, you know, when you get to know him, he's just a guy. He's, de- you know, he's older. He's dealing with health stuff. Steve Gerber. I was on the uh, Howard the Duck mailing list. And he would just chat. And, you know, when I would email him, I'd go, I have to get over being starstruck because, you know, boom, 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 boom. And then we would be able to talk. But I get starstruck by the comic people. Or when Kurt Swan was at the local convention. You know, he was real charming, down to earth. Uh, my favorite story he told was how he loved drawing comics because if he hurried up and got done by noon, he could go back <laughs> <laughs> before his wife got home. You know, to him it was just a job, but we, of course, look at it differently. And I think there's something about that for us comic fans, and I don't know if the younger fans feel that as much, where it's these people are, through their work, talking to us. And one of the things I noticed in all of the books that we brought up was we still, we turn into 12-year-olds about, oh, and that was so cool. You know, there's modern comics I like, but it's not that same level of, (gasps) Oh, that man thing story with the clown. Oh, that was so good. Well, it's like, you know, when I, when was the last time you felt that same feeling that you felt like? I remember when I used to, like I said, I used to go buy my comics at Real's Pharmacy. And when the day that comic books came out, me getting on my bike and racing, literally racing because you just couldn't wait. Yeah. I mean, when was the last time you felt that kind of excitement for, you know, whether it be movies? When was the last time you felt that kind of excitement for any? No. You know, for me, it was when Twin Peaks was on. Oh, yeah, me too. You know, because normally, even shows I like, it's like, ah, I'll watch it yeah. later when I have time. Twin Peaks, no, I'm sitting there in front of the TV, and I cannot, can't move till yeah, it's over. I think over. for me, it was like the original run of Babylon over. 5. I mean, I was like, i got to wait a whole week for this? I mean, is that, is that going to be the next thing I'm going to tell my kids? Sure, you sit down and binge your stuff. I used to have to wait a whole week. <laughs> I know, isn't that ridiculous how, you know, it's funny, I just finished watching uh, Stranger Things, the second season of it, and I go, season, what season is this? This is, I watched it in two nights, back to back. When I was doing too much, Stranger (laughs) Things, I mean, when I was, Twin Peaks, when I was, uh, that's my favorite TV show of all time, I I, I was like you, Corey, I could not wait. I remember when when they finally had the season where, um, uh, well, the main character where we find out, you know, about Bob. And I remember thinking when they, yes. I watched that thing, you know, because I had taped it, and I remember watching that thing like 13 times before I went to bed and thinking like, fuck, I yeah. can't believe it. I had to wait a whole freaking week. I mean, you had a whole season of it. Now you watch something like Stranger Things and you're literally like, I'm watching it in two days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this might be our longest episode ever. Oh, either. I thought I could have swore... The other one, the last one, I was pretty went pretty long too. I don't know. We did a previous one that went three parts. Well, this one is three hours, and I'm just sorry, kids. You're yep, getting the yep. whole thing because uh, we we don't get to talk to Angel enough, and uh, this is our favorite topic. And this is why when you go to a convention with Angel, the after party, you're going to be up way Maybe too Maybe you late. should yeah. uh, just put that in, as a before you hit the music. Just let people know, hey. This is what you just said. We're doing a whole three hours. So get ready, boys and girls. Well, whenever I do podcasts, whether it be with you guys or anybody else, I always just let myself go and just say, you know what? You guys will edit it down to whatever it needs to be edited. So I don't ever worry about it. So whenever I come on here, I, I can warn you all the time. Anytime you ask me to be on here, I'm going to be here for a long time because this is one of the few times I actually get to nerd out with somebody, so I'm going to take I'm going to take full advantage of it. Well, we will take full advantage of Ooh, you. Man. Wait, wait, it's what? Not the first time, and I doubt it'll be the last. <laughs> well, you're the one who keeps talking about my butt on uh, on on oh, Facebook. Uh, your heart shaped ass. Let's be more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there was reason we have no now, Angel. 
Angel, I don't do a lot of requests with you because we're pals, but I have a request. We need a sound drop. Okay. Angel, I need you to say, in just the way you type it, too, screw you, Strode. <laughs> All right, then, but I have to say, I need to build up an attitude here. Let me think of something. <laughs> All right, fine. And the first time you said it, I still remember one of my female friends took you to task. Yes, actually, what's her name? She goes to, <laughs> she goes to the, what's her name again? I'm brain farting here. She, I see her at Minneapolis all that. And I just explained. Yeah, but I just saw her at, uh, uh, oh, no, no, you're talking about a different I'm talking about one that you get, a, what's her name? She's an older lady. She, she volunteers all the time. I'm brain farting. Oh, Gwen okay. French? Gwen? No. Yeah, Gwen French, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she gave, okay. yeah, she gave me shit one time because I said that to you on Facebook. And she was like, Angel, what is up? We went on. I remember having to explain to No, 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 no. This is guy talk. This is how we bond guys. We bond. This is how we guys talk. Down. Yeah, yeah. So, and now she gets it. But you're one of the few people because the one thing I learned about Facebook is uh, – you have to be real careful with who you can say stuff like that because since people on, you know, so many people on it, they don't know your history or they don't hear the the sarcastic tone in your voice. There are people out there who do think that, you know, like, what is Angel's problem? So you're one of the few people that I can get away with that. <laughs> well, believe it or not, kids, you've listened to us talk comic books from the 70s for almost three hours. Screw you, Strode. <laughs> <laughs> so, Angel, um, you, you you still doing commissions and all that? Got any uh, any plans to tip your toes back into the uh, comic book market, or are you still just going to be milking fanboys like Joe for their uh, oh, yeah. commission well, money? Well, it's, uh, it's hard to because you do get, I mean, I just, uh, I just held a sale on Facebook and and I tell you, the, the internet's the best thing that ever happened for any artist. Now you can make uh, you make more money selling stuff on Facebook than you could before Marvel and DC. So it's kind of hard. Yeah, you know, I've gotten a few offers from Marvel and a couple actually from DC too recently. But uh, I'm waiting for something to come by that I really want to do. And so, uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm never going to say never again. But until I can finally self-publish something on my own. I really don't see anything coming out of the big two right now. And that's not because I have anything against them. It's just, you know, the industry's changed a lot. And, uh, you know, talking to you guys about it, I really want to do comics that I love as opposed to, you know, when DC offered me to do a Hawkman book and I saw the character, I go, that's not Hawkman. Why would I want to do that character? <laughs> Hawkman is the guy I grew up with, you know. So for me, it's really, you know, when I first got into I know this is going to sound corny as I'll get out, but... I honestly did make a promise to myself when I got into this business way back in the 80s that I would only do comics if it was fun for me because I don't want this to turn into a job that I hate because if it's going to turn into something like that, I might as well go get a regular job like everyone else and hate that. I don't want to hate the process of drawing. So for me, I've always, my whole career, I've been very, I mean, people have asked me, well, why never, how have you ever done an X-Men book or whatever, and my thing is, is unless it's a book that looks like I'm going to have fun with, I won't do it, you know, because I didn't get into this, bi- obviously I didn't get into the business for the money, because you don't make any money. I got into it because <laughs> I want to drop comedy. Well, that's the best answer I can think of. Me too. And as we say every week, the comic we like the least, we still like better than the comic that you like the I most. Agree. Joe? Everybody go to slapkirk.com. We'll see you next week. Hit my music. <laughs>